On today's episode, we have a very special guest, Ron Mita. He's the screenwriter of the movie SWAT, Robots, and 24 Hours to Live. We had the honor of meeting Ron at COC as our film teacher, which is where we actually got to shoot the podcast today, which is a great experience. Ron's going to break down some stories about screenwriting to us, and we're going to talk about film school a little bit. So stick around. So I was writing for, this is for Columbia Pictures, the movie Doom. You guys know the video game Doom, yeah. right? One morning, we we're actually literally driving to the movie studio to have a meeting about Doom. And um, on the radio, they're talking about Columbine. You remember the, the shooting at Columbine? Yeah. You're like, okay, you know, and every day when I get them, I'm like, how does the news affect my life? It doesn't. I'm a yeah. screenwriter. <laughs> well, guess what those kids, the trench coat mafia at Columbine was their favorite video game? Oh, Robots? No, Doom. <laughs> Step on my story. So. Look at my twins. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. Look at these twins. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. Look at these twins. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. Look at these twins. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary Kate. Kitties out, kitties out. Just and welcome back, and we're in to another episode of I'm a Come Clean Podcast. Wow, we made it. This is uh, College of the Canyons. Yeah, it's a little bit new. We have Jared. We have Ron Mita, our dad. <laughs> we have Dylan. What's good? We have intern Drew, about three rooms over. I know. We're so sorry, Drew. It's can, okay. Is, can you hear us? Drew? Yeah, I can hear you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's in space. Yeah, yeah. Bro. <laughs> made it. Forty from the moon. Isn't it cool? Like we have our own intern. It's like you're our dad, and that's your grandson. Well, you that's interned so for true. me, didn't you? Yeah. I I TA'd yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing yeah. for internship. I think Dylan, you did too, right? I did too. Yeah. yeah. You, just, you just nah. showed up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just vibing. It volunteered. <laughs> yeah. Well, we made it to another episode. What are this is forty eight, forty nine, and we're coming back to where we all met. That's right, man. What, were we good students? You guys were. You guys were. I Listen, I've been teaching film, and that's the class I met you guys in, although you might have been in my screenwriting classes, too. But, yeah, that was like after the fact. Though. But screenwriting was different, you know, it was like at your desk. But uh, the film class where I met you guys, and uh, over the 10 years I think I've done it, probably about four classes that I just loved. Like, mm -hmm. like they were just home runs. Uh, uh, your class was one of them. The one that was right after you was one of them. The first one I ever had was one of them, and then another. So, yeah. You guys were a great class. Yeah. Fun. I de yeah. Do you want to talk about like where we are right now? Yeah. We're in a normal place. College of the Canyons? Yeah, but more than just... I thought I said that. I mean, narrow it, narrow it okay. down. Now, what, is now, this room 315? Where uh, we? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Not that narrow. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny because I've heard you guys talking. I, I was listening to the podcast. We were talking about meeting at school. And you, you were making fun of COC a little bit. College. What did I say? No, you were talking about the community college oh. thing. And you guys were talking about, you know, it's definitely community college. And uh, and you're right, but on the other side of the coin, when I was listening to it, I'm thinking, yeah, but this is where you guys met. Yeah, you know, this is where your network started. So wait, did I say it in a mean way? I never. No, said, no, oh, you did okay. not. You like, said it in an all this way, which was like, you know, I can never tell if it's a joke or you're serious. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, 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 I wasn't offended, and I don't think anyone at COC would be offended. Just to say that you guys were kind of. Um, well, Jared, you were talking about like you, you know, you, you ended up here because you didn't, I think, have. A direction or something yeah. like at the time yeah. and uh you guys were all like why you got here and it's the same thing i hear from a lot of different students but I'm, my point is when you got here and you finally got together in a class and you met your crew that's it yeah because i yeah like we couldn't like at least like see like see kind of how it was like, gonna pan out yeah yeah because i remember like my first semester at like coc like all my friends were off to like universities yeah. and i'm like god damn i'm a loser right <laughs> yeah. why is there a grandpa in my class <laughs> <laughs> nice people but i i just had like there was like that mindset i'm like damn it i'm only here but then after like the first semester you come in and like oh i'm paying 50 dollars yeah for a class yeah and like and you meet people who like care i don't, I don't know because i i feel like when i i transferred to like a university it was i don't know there was like a like a vibe of like we're better yeah. you know but like the the work ethic isn't there but here's like if you want to make it out you'll make it out yeah. Well, and, and, and uh, there's something you kind of touched on there, too. Almost everybody you had a classroom, especially in this department, the film department, are working professionals, people who yep. work in the business. Yeah. Uh, you know, I went to film school, Loyola Marymount for graduate film school, and I had a great time there. But everybody I had there was a professor who was teaching film yeah. and maybe had worked in the industry 30 years earlier, 20 years earlier, but they weren't current. Yeah. We had one guy who was a sound guy. That was the only guy I ever had in my entire graduate degree that actually physically worked in the film industry. Everyone else was just theory. Yeah. Whoa. And, and when you come here, almost everyone you guys met with 
Yeah, yeah. Like, I remember yeah. like your first day. You're like, "What's up, y'all?" I wrote robots. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Uh, it, truth be told, I don't walk into the room saying that, but yeah. yes. <laughs> now, now that's a funny, that, but that's a funny He's story because I've been teaching here since uh, two, uh, 2002. Robots came out in 2003, I think. And um, at the time when it came out, I'm like, hey, everybody, I got a movie out called Robots, but they're all like t- 18 to 25-year-olds, yeah, and they look at me like, I don't really care. Yeah. Now... The guys who are younger than you or your age are in my class. And the first thing they come up to is, oh, my God, you wrote robots because yeah. they were like five or six. And and that movie means something That's to like them. It's like a part of us. Yeah. yeah. So they they come on and they're like, you know, they're, yeah. they're loving it. And I'm, God to us. So it's, it took 20, 15, 20 yeah. years, but I'm finally reaping the benefits. Yeah, That's so cool. beautiful. I literally just the other day, I should have brought this in, got my first fan letter for robots. Whoa. You're lying. No, I'm not kidding you. It's like some five-year-old, or it's an adult writing like a five-year-old. With their left hand. (laughs) Well, my wife, it's a letter, and he was really kind. He loved the movie and all that. And then he wants me to sign my autograph on a little index card. My wife goes, no, no, that's like someone's trying to steal your your signature. I said, well, then you sign it. (laughs) But um, you have something to bring out. <laughs> Where do they send it to you to? They have your address. You could find me online. I mean, please don't send me anything. But yeah, yeah you we're you know, address right here. Uh, you could <laughs> you could find most people. You know, uh, then again, I don't know how a five year old found me. Yeah. So one well, could be like his parents that kind of like went and like. Yeah, but the more thing, or it could be the Russians. I don't know. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Did that five year old have good penmanship, or was no, like in crayon? no, no? He didn't. He had what he had suspiciously five year old te- penmanship, which is like why well, I'm like. Is this some weird adult that wants? But he, again, what do you want my autograph for? Yeah. You, it, whatever. So I'm going to sign the hell. It's a fan letter. Yeah. <laughs> it took me that's forever cool. to get one. That's amazing. That's it, so wait, so what was the? Because uh, you sold your first script when you were in college, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, when I was at graduate school, yeah, at Loyola. Um, so I, 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 uh, I undergrad. Uh, I was a commercial art major, and, and my graduate, I was a lousy commercial artist. I got fired. Um, commercial artist? Yeah, you know, like graphic design. Oh, uh, okay. But we didn't have Macintoshes or anything good, so it was a freehand, and I'm just not that good at it. So Here's a rule to paper. We that was a on. career change. Uh, so I said, I've got to go to film school. So I proposed to my wife, and I said, hey, let's get married. Let's move to California. I'll go to film school. You'll work. Uh, how's that sound? And she was all in. So, uh, Whoa. When, you, when, when, you, when you made a switch. Um, well, I, I graduated. I went to Boston uh, and uh, worked in Boston at uh, Boston University. Uh, and then I w- got into their film school. Yeah. Uh, but I'm in Boston, and I know I sent you to Boston to go yep. to school, and I'm here trashing going to school Thank in Boston. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I should I have, that school. It was I, a good school. I yeah. should have gone to Emerson. I should yeah. not have gone to Boston University. Why? Oh, em- Boston University just wants money, and oh. uh, uh, and Emerson Same. wants people. I know, but they really do want talented people. That's yeah, just they- why I'm sending students there all the time. But I'm off track. So I, I, uh, I, I, I realize I got to go to Hollywood if I want to work in Hollywood. You know, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have, like, the ability to work remotely back then. So I... Um, we get married, moved to, uh, I apply to Loyola, I get in to film school, we come here, I go to film school, and I start uh, going to school, and it's a great school. Loyola is a fantastic film program, it's a top 10 program, and um, I, along the way, realized I really wanted to get more into screenwriting than, than filmmaking, because we were making films on film. Yeah. That's crazy. So a student film cost thousands of dollars, and it looked, looked like crap. Uh, and uh, and I started screenwriting, and uh, but then I also started working in the industry. I got some internships, which led to a job, and I was just like a you know a gopher boy, and just uh, you know I, I was literally called a runner. My job was to pick up stuff from one production company and take it to another, you know, in my own car, get people lunch. That's what I'm doing right yeah. now. Yeah, make sure you get yourself lunch when you get them lunch. Though. Yeah. It's like they give me the credit card, and I'm always making sure I got an extra meal. Um, Don't fire me, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's his advice. Huh? And then I, <laughs> and then I ended up getting a job as an assistant to a vice president at Universal Studios, a woman named Nina Jacobson, who's a, a big power player even Whoa, today. That Hollywood. name sounds really familiar. Yeah, she was the president of Disney after that, and then she uh, she produced uh, oh, the Mocking What are the? Uh, she's produced Hungry a lot Bird? of yeah. oh, Crazy Rich Asians. Actually, that's oh. that's hers, oh, okay. amongst others. So um, so I worked for her, and then while I was working for her, I met the people I needed to meet. And I uh, overnight got an agent, and uh, I, uh, and sold a script, and and I was on my way. So I hadn't graduated yet. I was still taking like one one. I was on your program, yeah. taking my time to get yeah. my degree. So, Real. Um, so it was funny because I was working uh, for Nina. I was going to school at Loyola, and I had a and I'd uh, gotten through some producers I'd met, some contacts to get uh, meet an agent. And I get a phone call on a Monday, 
uh, an agent named Gavin Pallone. He was the biggest agent in Hollywood at the time. He's probably still a big dog. I mean, he's like Jerry Seinfeld's agent. Oh, well. Yeah. And um, I get a phone call. Now, Gavin would be calling our office because he'd be calling my boss, Nina. And uh, so the phone rings. It's Gavin Pallone. I go, hold on. I'll get her. And they go, no, I want to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, shit. What did I do? You know? <laughs> How did I screw something up? And he had read my script, and he goes, I need you to come down here right now. He was at United Talent Agency at the time. I was in Beverly Hills. So that's a Monday. So I get down there. I have a writing partner. We both get down there. And uh, we go in, and we're like in United Talent Agency. All these big agents are in the room, and they go, we've never sold a script for less than six figures. And like right now, I'm like, wow. And so we do too. Yeah. So that was a Monday. They sent the script out on uh, Wednesday night. And Thursday, it sold to Columbia Pictures for $450,000 against a million, Dang. which means I got paid four fifty dollars up front. I would get the other half of if they ever made the movie. They didn't make the movie. It was called Trackdown, and Jodie Foster got attached to the movie. It was a female action film, female action uh, oh. picture. So that happened from a, Sunday, from a, from a, a Monday to a Thursday. Uh, and, That's uh, crazy. And, and at, at that point, like, how much like screenwriting like experience did you have? How many, well, how many scripts did you that have? Was that was the point? second script I ever wrote. What? Uh, the, I mean, you know, I'd written stuff for school, but yeah. that was a second. I, I'd written a, a, a screenplay beforehand that was kind of a goofy kids thing, and it didn't have a, the, the right vibe. But this one, I said, okay. I looked around. I said, what's hot? Well, this was the Die Hard era, mm-hmm. and everything was Die Hard in a. That's what we call it, Die Hard in a, like, you know, Die Hard in a bus. Die, that was speed. Die Hard in a ship. <laughs> you know, that was everything was contained action. And Die Hard, which is still the granddaddy, you know. Uh, so we wrote Die Hard in the English Channel Tunnel. Uh, there's a tunnel between England and France called the Channel. It's a 35-mile tunnel. And we said, hey, well, what if you have like a diehard situation in there? And the only person that could save the day is a female engineer who helped construct the thing. So everything just clicked right, and Jodie Foster gets wind of this thing. And the next thing we know, it's sold for a lot of money. Then, and this is Hollywood, and this is a good lesson, we get a phone call the next day. This is Friday. Now I'm celebrating. Yeah. Oh, no, I have a great story. But I'm a, we, uh, At the club? No, no, no. This, no, this is a great story. So I sell the script. I'm at my desk. Remember, I'm an assistant to the vice president. Phones are ringing. The agent keeps calling. Okay, with the price that we just got more money. We got more money. It keeps going up. And finally, uh, and then uh, Universal, whom I work for, they say to Universal, hey, do you want to buy it? And Universal passes on it. My boss passes on Your own it. people. My own people pass on it. <laughs> so, but it's okay. We sell it, and, and Nina and myself and a bunch of us go out to lunch to celebrate, and we get back for lunch. And the president of the studio, the president of the studio, a guy named Casey Silver, he was a good guy, calls me up to his office. And I'm like, okay, he's going to congratulate me. And he goes up to my office. He goes, look, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think we own your screenplay. And I'm like, what? He goes, well, you're an employee of Universal oh, Studios. Wow. And, uh, and we think we own your screenplay, that you have to sell it to us. So I call this guy agent, this agent, guy, Gavin Plow, and I says, hey, Universal says they own the screenplay. He goes, fuck them. If they want it, they can pay a you know, million five. I'm like, okay, nice for you to say that, but I'm sitting in this guy's <laughs> office. So uh, I, uh, um, I'm like, uh, you know, he goes, so here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to read it tonight. You know, we're going to decide what we're going to do. And um, tomorrow we'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, I'm not too worried about it because the agent's not worried about it and he runs Hollywood. The next day they, they passed on it. Now, what's funny is, so ultimately Columbia Pictures bought it and that was where it, where it went. Uh, I worked for Universal for two more weeks. That was the best two weeks of my life when you've like, I'm the highest paid screenwriter and I'm an assistant. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm getting people coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Spinning uh, it. Yeah. I, that was before I was uh, sold a screenplay. <laughs> so, I, uh, so it was a good two weeks and it was fun. To, um, but anyway, um, uh, after I left, oh, oh, the reason Universal actually didn't have any leg to stand on, and I was an hourly employee. I was an assistant. So I was like a guy who punched the clock. Mm-hmm. If I were a contracted employee, if I was an executive, they would have uh, rights to my intellectual property. That's crazy. But I was a low-level guy. Yeah. But after I left, they made all the assistants and all the, the oh, people sign a deal yeah. that they would have the rights to their films. I like to call it the oh. Ron Mita law. So if you work at Universal, it's because of me that you have to like show Universal your product, uh, something you've written. Be- so 
what would happen? Even though just, Universal doesn't want to see it. Yeah, like that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So what, what would happen? Let's say, let's say you go, you write something, you're like, oh my god, I struck gold, but you're working at Universal. Could you just be like, yeah, I'm gonna quit, and then I'm gonna go pitch this? Well, yeah, and then it bombs. More yeah. than likely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. More than likely, you're gonna quit and not sell it. Now you're gonna be out of a job. Okay, but I'm uh, saying, but like, could they still get you? Like, no, you wrote that on our time. I don't like, honestly, because you're an hourly employee. I don't think they'd have a legal leg okay. to stand on. You know, it's like literally me and the janitor were hourly employees. You're gonna own everything he wrote too. Yeah. So. Um, so no, so all I know is though that assistants and people I knew after me, and this is, you know, in the nineties, um, had to sign a contract saying that they would show universal their product first. Uh, I'm like hey, universal. I was sitting in that place for two years. I was literally writing on your, t- I shouldn't say that because <laughs> <laughs> I still want a job. y'all. <laughs> yeah. No, I was like writing while I was being paid. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. um, anyway, so, um, no, he's okay. You can let it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the <laughs> first ten minutes out. <laughs> the ship has sailed. Trust me. Uh, so um, uh, anyway, so I, I sold the script, and then that was it. I was a professional writer after that. It was kind of awesome. My second script that I wrote uh, it was called The French Teacher. I know that sounds like a porn movie. It's Uh-oh. not. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, it was a. It was, that was kind of a Jean Claude Van Damme kind of vehicle. Universal Pictures bought that one. Oh, whoa. Yeah, so, so just the, two in a row you sold? Uh, well, the second one, a couple of months later. I, I uh, uh, Yeah, it. yeah. I and mean, you're getting paid 400 grand for them? Like, yeah, you don't get 400 grand every time, but okay. you do get good money. Yeah. Trust me, the money was very good uh, and continues to be. But um, uh, uh, but I, um, but I, it was funny that the second time I wrote it, Universal was like, oh, we'll buy that one. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> this one sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we didn't like the first one that had Jodie Foster, but something with Jean-Claude. Hey, yeah. good. I wanted to yeah. ask, um, when you were when you wrote that first one, uh, or the second one that, that got you uh, the deal yeah. the first round, first time around, was that like, um, did you feel like an ego at that time? Yeah, like, like how old were you among, at that point? Among like the other people that you... So I was, how old was I? I was um, probably like 28, 29. Uh, you know, I got to Hollywood when I was 25. I think I was 25. And then uh, got to Loyola when I was 25. And so, you know, it happened overnight over five years, you know? So, right. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, uh, had to work my way up the food chain and meet the right people and make the network and not be too ingratiating, like, hey, I'm a writer. Yeah. You know, uh, you kind of want them to find out on their own. Yeah. But um, so it, it, what, the, the question again? I don't know. Like, did you did you feel like a, a bit of an ego from that or like? So, yeah, feel- yeah, I, I, I did. I, I got to tell you, because you sell it for a lot. I'm, at, I'm on the front page of the trades. Right. Uh, I was featured. If you go Google me, you might find this. I was featured in L.A. Times. It was like uh, uh, there's a whole article about us in the L.A. Times. Like young stud. Oh, and land script. <laughs> and so in the article in the L.A. Times, they said, "Well, what do you want to do next?" I go, "Well, I'd really like to meet Michael Eisner. He was the head of Disney at the time." And then, like the next day in the mail, comes a letter from Michael Eisner <laughs> saying, "I'm ready." <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like. So, so I showed it to my agent. I'm like, Michael Eisner is like, you know, uh, it, 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 you guys are probably too old, but Michael Eisner was the, the top of Hollywood at the time. And uh, I never ended up in meeting with him, but it was kind of cool. Those things are happening. So um, I was getting a lot of press. Loyola, because I still hadn't graduated, their media department really helped me. They put a lot of, they, they bragged a lot. You know, two That's of cool. our, our, our graduates just sold them a, a, a big deal Hollywood film. And I've sold and so. We were getting a lot of attention, and it was good. It, it, it helpful too. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Did you feel? Um, sorry, I had another question about that. Um, oh, did like anybody that you knew, like your um, like other friends or anything, reach out to you? That like I feel like that happens sometimes too. Yeah. When, he, when you do oh, something. Oh, now that he's hot. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm oh, gonna say you're the new hot girl. No, no. no. <laughs> I, uh, uh, being a screenwriter is not very sexy, so you don't meet a lot of like hot people. <laughs> like Aaron Sorkin, hubba hubba. <laughs> um, but um, no, uh, I had a lot of friends who were in the kind of a similar position to me. They were all coming up. Some people that I was an assistant with went on to be you know pretty big time people. There's a guy Mark Verratti, and he's a uh, produces the Transformer movies, oh, you know, well. things like that. So we were just the same guys getting coffee. Yeah. So it was kind of neat. And this is the same thing for your network right now. The people you come up with. They one of you gets a good jump, and then the others do, and maybe because of each other, maybe not. But uh, in uh, so there were people I came up with who 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 ran into su- success. I had friends who became TV writers. That's cool. And such, it was kind of neat. But no, um, you know, going back to the ego thing, I, I think I certainly my head was swollen for a while. The second script sold; it didn't sell for four fifty, so it sold for like half that, like two hundred. But I'm like still, still not yeah. complaining. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like suddenly you realize, okay, maybe I'm not worth four fifty every time. But yeah. you do get a raise in Hollywood. Now those were both spec scripts. 
Remember, and we talk about spec scripts here on my screenwriting class. Those are scripts you write on your own. Uh, you own it. It's your idea. You write it days, nights, you know, on the side. And uh, the nice part is when you sell those, you know, it, you don't have a production company or any behind you. You sell it. They buy it. That's your money, you know. Yeah. So it's a good deal if it sells. That, I will say, the 90s was big on spec scripts. Mm -hmm. Studios were just buying millions, million-dollar deals, like, every week. It was crazy. Dang. Yeah. Do you think they could still make that movie from your first? So, that that movie uh, track down, uh, um, it was a it was a really good uh, a screenplay, a really exciting story. It definitely could be made, probably should be made. And again, it it, it well it starred a female, yeah. but this is actually a funny story. So, uh, well, two things: a we got fired like wow. the next day after they sold it. Agent calls and says, "Yeah, you've been you've been replaced." I'm like, "What?" He goes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm still in my assistant's chair. And he goes, ah, oh, don't worry about it. It happens to everybody. Someday you'll be replacing people, which is true. It happened to me down the line. So I'm like, okay. So now what? He goes, well, you still owe them a draft because when, when you sell a screenplay, you owe them a draft and a set of revisions. So um, go in, take your meeting. So we go in, we take our meeting, we do a draft, uh, a, a set of revisions. Yeah, they, I don't think they read it. They replace us because now they got Jodie Foster. They want to get like a big time, you know, so they got this guy, Kevin Jar, and I think Kevin Jar wrote um, Rambo oh. or something like that. But, yeah. And so they got Kevin Jar, they replaced us with this guy, they're paying him a lot of money. And over the course of the next 12 months, he has a nervous breakdown and he like either never completes it or whatever. So then they bring in this female writer because it's, you know, it's a female driven lead and this girl named Alex Saros, and I, I think I got her name right. And she writes it and it just turns into something horrible. So. Again, I have no say because I don't own this anymore. I've sold it to them. They own it. Yeah. A year and a half later, I get a phone call and they say, hey, have you read the script? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying not to be rude. Like, it sucks, but yeah. <laughs> and uh, they go, you want to come on down and just chat and have a talk? So I'm like, okay. Well, it usually means a free lunch. So I go down and we talk. And in the conversation, basically, they had us back to say, we'd like to rehire you. And I'm like, okay. But just so we all know, you spent a million and a half dollars on other writers and the guy goes, yes, but you have to understand, we had to go there to get where we are today. And I'm like, where we are today is me back in the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, warming up the seat. <laughs> right. In, in any other industry, if you were making hinges or bicycle spokes and you spent a million and a half dollars and got nothing out of it, you'd be fired. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but in Hollywood, that's just another day at the office. So we came back. We started writing. But then, they, then I got into the Arnold Schwarzenegger sweepstakes. Now, I'll tell you what that is. In the, in the 90s, Arnold's top of his game, right? Uh, just every big Arnold movie is, mm -hmm. is happening. And Arnold's people are sniffing around Hollywood for any action film, anything exciting. And they're like, hey, uh, track down, woman uh, engineer in English Channel Tunnel. Um, Arnold's interested. I'm like, but she's a woman. So, <laughs> Very so, progressive of his time. So, right, so the studio <laughs> pays us to change her to a him. Did you just like control F and change him to her? <laughs> they didn't exist back then. I should have just done they and then yeah, they could have that Yeah, but uh, we did uh, her to a him. So every, so she became a he. She be, uh, and, and then it was kind of the same dynamic, but he's Arnold so he could do a few more physical things. She was smart. She used her brain. Arnold used like his muscles. So we write a, a, a male draft, but they're, and they're like, okay, we still might get a female lead and Arnold might not be interested. So every other week we're writing a male draft and a female draft. God. And I have these in them. There are two stacks of drafts of this. There's a female version of Trackdown, and there is a male version of Trackdown. The female is smarter, and she's more you know, intellectual, and the, the male version is more brawny and tough and badass and says things like, I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that went along. And then they said, okay, Arnold's reading it now. And Arnold yeah. must read in German or Viennese because he, uh, it took a year. <laughs> and... and, and and he never really passed, governor? he never really passed on it, but no. he would do this to all the action screenplays. Arnold's people would yeah. take it and hold it and not read it or read it and not reply. And so there were a lot of action films in Hollywood that just were in hold mode because Arnold was reading it. Um, ultimately, you know, time goes by, a year goes by, and that's never good for a film production. It, and interest wanes and people move on. And yeah. so that that just died in the vine. You you know. Columbia owns it. It's sitting there somewhere. Sony owns it, yeah. and um, but it was good. I mean, it got us in the room. Yeah. It, it met, we met the right people. Are uh, you were you ever getting like burnt out just writing like that many scripts? Like, in, uh, well, you're getting paid. You're yeah. getting paid. Um, oh, it's bi-hourly additional. No, the... um, you get paid for each draft, and oh, cool. and they had to keep 
you know, paying us not a ton, but you get paid to write drafts. So well, you'll be like, I just want to get a Honda Civic real quick. Let me write this bullshit. Well, I, I <laughs> now you got to be careful in Hollywood because people do always ask for a free draft. Like, hey, would you uh, mind doing, uh, uh, yeah, why don't you do this uh, free draft? And you got to be careful because you don't want to work for free. On the other side of the coin, you want to be a good player. You know, yeah. it's like I'm part of the team. But everyone else is making millions of dollars. Why are you trying to get a free draft out of me? So you do have to be careful about that. Did you learn that? Like, was somebody helping you, like a mentor of sorts? Well, agent. Or, oh, okay, just yeah. your agent. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the agent's like, we ain't doing shit for gotcha, free. Gotcha, yeah. yeah. And you, um, but you were, you were kind of blind to it at first. Oh, yeah, when you're young, you're naive. You're excited to be in the room. Right. And so that's the problem when you're a young screenwriter is you agree to everything. Bad ideas, you agree to them. Um, and uh, so it's, that's kind of a dangerous thing. We would take a lot of meetings with a lot of producers. And those uh, producers say, hey, I got an idea about, uh, um, oh, there's a funny one. Uh, uh, this guy, he wanted to make a movie about like an NCIS kind of thing. This is way before NCIS. I was like, oh, that's a cool idea. Uh, he didn't really have much of an idea. So so, um, so he goes, you know, go away, come back and pitch me an idea. I'm like, and so we're all excited. We go away and we work for like three weeks coming up with a really good idea. But that's free work we're doing. No one was paying me to do that. We come in, we pitch this idea to him. <laughs> and the guy's honest answer was this. He's like, I like it. Can you put a lesbian in it? <laughs> um, and it goes, I'm a young screenwriter who's like, yeah, sure, we can get a lesbian in there. Because you agreed to all sorts of yeah. stupid stuff. Um, but when you're young, you say yes too much, but you don't want to piss people off either. Yeah. Yeah. For what was the, the craziest thing you bought when you got that first check? Well, I was married, and we, uh, we, we had already bought a house. So, oh, oh whoa. Oh, actually... My new house. Uh, uh, when when we um, no no actually I'm not from the first group. I sold when I when I sold SWAT I bought my new house. But oh. um, no, we didn't buy much. You know why? Uh, um, we sold the script. I had a house that was already expensive to own a house or par- you know have a mortgage, and we had a, a baby coming. And uh, I'm practical. My wife is even more practical. And so we're like we're not spending this money. And I did know this because at least I had worked in the industry as an assistant that your money comes and goes. And when you're a writer, you get paid, you get a lot of money, and then you'll have no money. You won't get paid again for a year, possibly. And you got to learn how to live on the money you get and how to spread it out. Now, fortunately, my wife works, and she is non-pro, as I like to tease her. Non-pro is the Hollywood rude term for she's not in the industry. And they, It's the Harry Potter a haggle? Yeah, a she's a muggle. A muggle. Yeah, she's, a a muggle. Ho- yeah. <laughs> she's totally a Hollywood muggle. Like, yeah. She's not one of us. Yeah. And I like to tease her about that. But thank God she's not one of us because she works at UCLA. She does really well. She's, and, um, and so there's times when my income is way up and then there's times when it's not as a writer. So you, you definitely, if you're in the entertainment business, do not marry another entertainment business yeah. person. Unless it's like, you know, a famous movie star. She's got millions. <laughs> I remember like, that's what I, like a mentor told me that he's like, there could only be room for one headshot in the house. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. One, one <laughs> well, ego. Yeah. Like, one, it's an ego thing though? It's, I think it's an ego. Yeah, I think it's because there would be like a jealousy thing like, oh, he sold the script. Right. You're always and competing what? against oh. each other. I'm still PAing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing crafties on this Lifetime set. On his set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You want a job, babe? Yeah. <laughs> Drive well, this pass van. <laughs> look, it's so cool. Like, Julia Louis Dreyfus is married to a guy named Brad Hall. And uh, um, and he's a great, he was a com- comedian. He, you've seen him, but she's like the top of Hollywood. So it's got to be tough, but maybe you just check your ego at the door. And it's like, my wife's cooler than me. And that's yeah. the way it is. Yeah. It's like, if it's yeah. love, it's love. Yeah. yeah. I but, wanted to ask yeah. um, for your, like, when how they paid you because sometimes like we do gigs or mm-hmm. freelance or whatever and sometimes we'll get like paychecks like months later because they don't care about us um, so, so how was that help work? so <laughs> I, I, most of most of my earlier work was always with movie studios because back then you didn't have many of these independent producers and yeah. um, and the studios are great because okay. their bookkeeping is great their check writing is fast uh, they don't mess around they will get you your check fast, but they also expect you to obey their deadlines. Like, yeah. do not be late. Uh, if you have 12 weeks or eight weeks for whatever it is, you know, don't be late. Yeah. So they don't screw around, but I don't mind that. So that was never hard. I never really had to chase down my money. Um, and then the nice thing is uh, just down the line, once a film gets produced, I also get mo- uh, residual money. Right. Which comes from the studios, goes to the Writers Guild, comes to me. But... Um, Later in life, I started working for companies like that or smaller independent companies because they're all over the place now. Like my latest film, 24 Hours to Live, was through uh, a 
production company called Thunder Road, but the money was really coming from Saban Pictures, the Power Rangers guys. Oh, well. But they've been making tons of like medium level expensive movies. That one was always a little harder to make sure we got paid on time. You know, it's so I don't like being my own money guy. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, having to chase it down. What's, what's on time, though? So, like, how quick is the turnaround time? Well, it's I mean, like... the bottom line is you have a contract mm-hmm. and it's got very specific dates and times. You know, once you sell something, you're given a contract. And I would say to anyone that, you know, if you ever or anyone ever sells a script, certainly if they have an agent, great, but a lawyer is the key at that point. You can get them per, you know, you, some people have them on retainer, some people have them per, um, per sale. But you definitely want a lawyer, and it's worth the investment because there's a lot of details in the contracts. They're thick contracts and a lot of funky stuff, and the lawyers make a lot of good changes that that help you get your money promptly. Speaking of, like, the turnaround, have you ever had, like, a turnaround time that was so quick, like you wrote a script in, like, X amount of hours or something? No, yes and no. Um, Generally speaking... um, Robots? uh, No, that that, that one took years. Yeah, that Um, one's a good one. um, But, um, no... um, uh, generally speaking, because uh, uh, sc- screenplays are written, you know, years before they're made, and so um, uh, you usually weren't under the gun. There was always someone like, oh, "I want it tomorrow," but it wasn't so bad. But here's a funny story. So I was writing for this is for Columbia Pictures, the movie Doom. You guys know the video game Doom, yeah. right? Sounds right in Doom, and uh, based on the video game. And I was like, stay up till all hours playing the game, which really doesn't have much of a story. It's a but study, yeah, uh, and. Um, so we're writing it, and um, one morning we're actually literally driving to the movie studio to have a meeting about Doom, and um, on the radio they're talking about Columbine. You remember the, the shooting at Columbine? Yeah. You're like, okay, you know. And every day when I get up, I'm like, how does the news affect my life? It doesn't. I'm a screenwriter. <laughs> well, guess what? Those kids, the trench coat mafia at Columbine, was their favorite video game. Robots. No, Doom. <laughs> <laughs> Step on my story. <laughs> So, so they uh, they were they loved the game Doom, and the media was running about the. I mean, literally from the moment that story broke, from my getting in the car in Santa Clarita to arriving in Culver City. Dang. Uh, we get them to go. Yeah, um, we're canceling the movie. Damn. <laughs> so I'm like, well, we haven't even written. So we had just developed it, but we hadn't written it. We had like all our notes. We we're ready to go. Now, don't worry about it. I still get paid. You cancel the movie, I still get paid. Um, but we uh, we're like, okay, here's the thing. Someday they will make this movie, but they'll make it with other writers. Mm-hmm. It'll come back to, to uh, someday. So I said, oh, well, we already wrote it. And they're like, what are you talking about? I said, I said, yeah, we wrote it already. So, you know, what are we supposed to do about that? And they're like, um, okay, well, can we read it? I'm like, yeah, I'll get it to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So we go now. Why now? You ask me why did I say that? You know, the film wasn't being made. Well, it might be made someday. Yeah. Mm. If and since I'd only worked on developing the story so far, that would be the end of it. But if I had actually physically written it, I knew that if the movie ever got made, I could arbitrate for movie credit because I would have been the first one to write it. You follow me? Because it's written. So I go home uh, and we write a two hundred page script overnight <sighs> because we didn't care if it was good or not. We just wanted to make sure every thought in the world was in that script. I mean, we, mm-hmm. and we just did it. We were just writing stuff, crazy stuff. So we wrote a 200-page script overnight. It's the worst script ever. Uh, <laughs> it didn't matter, right? It just had to have every concept of the game or every possible thing. Demons, Martians, you name it. Okay, so we handed it to the studio. They're like, uh, really? Thank God, <laughs> thank God we canceled this film. These guys are horrible writers. Um, and, that, and, and, and so the film goes away. Years later... I see in the trades, they've made the movie at Warner Brothers. It was starred The Rock. It's Doom. It's the video game Doom. Rock was in it at... What year? What year was oh, that? that was probably 15 years ago, maybe. I don't know. Um, this is Doom. It was made by Warners. I was at Columbia. Okay. So two things. I go, I go on to IMDb, and I, and I add myself as one of the writers in the movie. And IMDb, that you have to kind of confirm it. Well, I, I, uh, I confirmed it by showing them the article in the trade papers that said I was one of the writers on Doom because it had been published in the trades. So I'm on there for about uh, four or five months. And finally, like someone from Warner Bros. like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and why is he getting writing credit on IMDb? Um, I then called the Writers Guild and said, I want to, uh, just before the movie uh, was about to come out and said, I want to arbitrate for credit. And they're like, well, who are you? And why are you arbitrating? And I said, I wrote the first draft of Doom. And they're, they, the writers, everyone was confused. How is this even possible? 
At the end of the day, the Writers Guild's lawyers decided I did not have a right to arbitrate because I wrote it for a different studio. Oh. And I'm like, yeah, but I wrote it for the same product. Yeah. I, I lost that. I, did, I never uh, got into the table, but my plan was very sound. That was, yeah. And, and I, I was very proud of myself for years earlier having thought, someday this will happen. And when they do, I'm going to come calling. Only I got nothing. Yeah. Uh, and at least you still had the opportunity to, like, to fight for that. I, I did it a second time. Um, I wrote a film called Video Killed the Radio Star, the MTV movie. And, uh, and That's I, the 80s song, right? It, well, it's the 80s song. It's the story yeah. of the, the beginning of MTV. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the same thing, that project died. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I quickly wrote it overnight and handed it. <laughs> and if they ever make it, I'm like, I'm arbitrating. Yeah. <laughs> you just you take every idea yeah. ever. Yeah. 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 Mickey yeah. Mouse is about to be for everyone. I'm yeah. gonna... <laughs> That's wild. That is wild. Yeah. Did you like make a beat sheet for those 200 pages or did you just Tarantino and just like okay. just start from page one? And so just going to... you guys have taken my screenwriting class, but for people who don't know, I, uh, one of the keys that I teach is about beat sheets. It's about what we call plot points. Mm -hmm. uh, writing very detailed outlines before you get to a screenplay stage because you, you should never just sit down and just start writing a screenplay. It's like wandering in the desert. So yeah, in every instance... I had copious notes, tons of oh, notes, okay. more than enough information to start writing. But when I'm writing an overnight trash like that, I'm literally just putting everything. When I wrote the uh, the, the MTV one overnight, I'm putting in Madonna and Prince. They're all just like showing up, having coffee and stuff. Because <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. I just need yeah. tons of stuff so that I can arbitrate it if it ever gets made. I That's wanted cool. to talk about yeah. like, because Robots was kind of a film that we grew up. We were yeah. little kids when that came out. Probably. Yeah. Um, and I went to school with... Um, your writing partner, maybe at the time, Jim. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, his his son went to my school. Oh, Caleb, yeah. 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 And I grew up with him. And I remember uh when he was talking about that, that his dad I think I think he like for show and tell or something, his dad came in and talked about how he wrote or yeah. helped write robots. Um but yeah, I, I mean it was like a film that we all kind of like really liked. Yeah. I remember and Aldous and Jared watched it recently. What are your notes on it? Good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got my problems. I have a problem with everything that's been made. It, it is a very nice film. Yeah. It was, in my visual, in my mind, it was for older people. It was going to be, it was going to skew older. It, they skewed it young. It's a little there raunchy. are still so many innuendos. Oh, though. no, there yeah. are. But I wanted to go like uh, the, the eight to 15 year olds. I think they went oh, more okay. from like a little bit like, it's it's fine. It's yeah. really cute. And it's got some great people in it, you know. Uh, um and uh, but here's a funny story about that. So we were at 20th Century Fox and we were pitching a movie to their special effects people about giant bugs. And they're like, you know, it was about giant bugs that took over a town. And they're like, oh, we don't like that. Uh, I'm like, OK, but but we have this script that we want you to look at. We don't like this script. Uh, it's for an animated movie. And so they gave us a, this, this screenplay and uh, they say, what can you do with it? The screenplay is about you'll know where I'm going in a second. It's about a mastodon and a, a saber-toothed tiger, uh, and uh, a marmot, whatever it is. Yeah. It was Ice Age. Yeah. And they go, you know, we just don't know if we're going to do Ice Age. So we go away, and we take Ice Age, and we come back two weeks later and go, okay, well, what if it's a planet of all robots, and a spaceship lands on the planet, and, uh, the, and there's humans in there. They're all dead, but there's one baby. And the robots have to take the baby to this like encampment of humans on the other side of the planet. I mean, we're just taking the story they had yeah. mm -hmm. and changing it to robots. And only two weeks have gone by, they go, no, no, we're making um, the movie the way it is, but we like the robots thing. So go away and come up with another robot story. So we went home, we had our robots, but we didn't have the story anymore. Yeah. So then we came up with, and if you watch robots, you'll see what the story is. It's the Three Musketeers. We just took the Three Musketeers. Oh. If you know the story of the Three Musketeers, the character D'Artagnan is the country boy who comes to the who comes to Paris and joins up with the ragtag gang of, uh, in this case, they were musketeers. Uh, uh, um, ours uh, and and there is a uh, evil uh, cardinal who has uh, supplanted the uh, the king, and that's pretty much what the story of Robots is. So, at its heart, Robots is the Three Musketeers. You yeah. just have to look through it. Wow. Ultimately, as it went on, we removed the Three Musketeers portion of it and made them more like just these clanky, lovable losers kind yeah. of thing. And uh, um, you know, speaking of that, I did actually get a couple fan letters about robots not too long ago from at least two of them, from, uh, not letters online, uh, emails uh, from members of the trans community. 
And I thought that was interesting. Yeah. So I got this really nice letter from this, this uh, trans person who said um, they really embraced the movie as, as you know, empowering. And I'm like, I, I don't, re and they, well, their point was, when Rodney Copperbottom is a little kid, it's early in the film, he, uh, he gets hand-me-down parts, hand-me-down legs. And for a while, he wears a dress. Yeah. And it's not a big deal. It's just, it's how you, and so this little beat in the story really, spoke to this particular person yeah. that had said, you know, I felt really good about it. I wanted to say, well, that was my plan in 2003. <laughs> uh, it wasn't, but I was pleased that it made somebody feel good. I mean, yeah. Anytime you get that's someone cool. feeling good because of something you wrote, that's yeah. pretty, good. That's pretty good. good. Most of the stuff I write is about violence and death. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you get a little pro-trans stuff in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did yeah. you get a lot of like that, like bad uh, messages or like death well, threats and stuff? No, I, don't, I think most anti-trans people don't even... Can't, couldn't even find that well, part I mean, to like, see it. I mean, like, in general. In oh, no, no. Now, listen, none of the accolades tend to come to me. I mean, it, it, studios get letters. Oh, the, right. the movie stars get letters. As a writer, and, and you, you know, you, so you That's kind of nice. You get yeah. to live in the shadows a little yeah. bit. You do. Uh, listen, you want to be the least sexy job in Hollywood is being a screenwriter mm. because uh, you're mostly home. When you go to the set of your own movie, when I went to the set of SWAT, I had to ask permission. That's crazy. It's yeah. like... Uh, and, and then they look at you like, it would be so nice if you weren't here right now. <laughs> because I think a lot of writers show up and they're just paying the asses. They're like, I didn't write that. And he shouldn't be saying that. And, no. you know, and uh, I'm not that guy. I'm like, you paid me. You could do whatever you want. You just want to have yeah. the free crafty. and just Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, they had good food on SWAT. So yeah. like, literally, we would go there and eat. And like, oh, I got to go watch them do one thing over and over for an yeah. hour. Until they get it right. It was so boring to go to this. Did you get to meet anybody? Like I, I mean, I... Uh, uh, Samuel Jackson, uh, that one, I mean, it wasn't like hanging out with them. You know, you get introduced real quick and then they forget five minutes later. Yeah. Uh, LL Cool, oh, this is actually cool. I met with LL Cool J about five, three or four years before he was actually cast in the movie SWAT. And he was the only guy when we were writing that screenplay that we wrote a scene, uh, the, the, the character for, this character in the street. And um, so when I met with him, uh, we were just meeting, a general meeting with him. He was a super cool guy. And uh, and um, I said, oh, you know, we've written this this role for you in the movie Swap, but you know, it's like three years from being made. And then later on, when the movie was made, he was cast in it. It's not like we ever told anyone it was written for him, but yeah. it, it literally was. So it was kind of cool that he was in the Whoa, role. Whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. Did you ever get like starstruck? Um, well, only once. Oh. Um, uh, you, you know, I. Like you guys, you live in Hollywood community. You, you know, you're not supposed to like walk up to celebrities or anything like that. I, I got starstruck oh. twice. Um, I'll do the, the once was I was pitching a TV series idea to Dick Van Dyke. Oh well. Wow. Now, yeah, you, know, you you guys know who he is, but in my generation, you know, Dick Van Dyke, you know, Mary Poppins, and and the Dick Van Dyke TV show is like television history. And he's 96 years old right now. This yeah, is, he was on our, because uh, I'm working for Days of Our Lives, and they just had him like last really? week come oh, to the right. studio. Are you and, kidding like, me? No, yeah, that happened. And everyone's like freaking out. I'm like, I know the name. No. Don't know the fella. Oh, my God. But no, that's cool. No, yeah. it, there's probably no one, no bigger Hollywood, a, a, a person alive right now with a bigger Hollywood history than wow. him. Wow. Uh, uh, movies, TV shows, really just a very important. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so he was on a TV show. Of uh, his own, uh, you know, it's like a murder she wrote kind of show. And we met with him. Uh, we were working on a, a proposal for a TV series, and I got to meet with him, and he was just like the coolest guy. And then there, I'm like, oh, I grew up watching this guy on Mary Poppins, one of my favorite movies, yeah. and and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and just all sorts of stuff. And so I'm like, I'm with Dick Van, and you know, at this point, I met tons of Hollywood people, but that was really cool. And that's the only autograph I've ever asked for. No. And I had a, a an album of mine from when I was a child of Mary Poppins. So I, I asked him to sign it. He signed the album. He signed it right over Julie Andrews' face. I'm like, he could have left that open. Julie's still alive. I might be able to, I might be able to track Eddie. her down. So kill the eBay value. So, um, but it was so cool. Um, the uh, there's another person I met that I did not get an autograph was I met with Stan Lee. Oh wow. Um, we met on the set of the movie Volcano. Remember the movie? It's about a volcano shows up in the, uh, like over at the La Brea Tar Pits. It was a good movie. It's oh. a crazy ass uh, action film. And we met, this is before Marvel was yeah. truly Marvel. And we met on uh, Captain America. We were going to do a Captain America movie. This is 10, Whoa. 15 years before Marvel coalesced and, and became relevant. They were very irrelevant at the time. Yeah. Uh, and I got to meet Stan Lee, and I probably should have asked for like a, a bought a comic book with me. You know, mm -hmm. Gil Gutt of Spider Man number one or something like that. And, yeah. 
uh, just so I could buy a house with it. When, uh, so. yeah. Yeah. What was he doing there? Like uh, uh, Stanley. Well, it was, it was Captain America, so he was. Oh, uh, uh, you said you met him on Volcano. So what was oh, he. I don't Volcano? know why he was there. Oh, you know why the producers of Volcano mm-hmm. were going to be the producers. It was um, uh, of. Uh, 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 of the Captain America movie. So it never materialized. We met with him. It was kind of cool. But uh, other than the cool factor, it never materialized. But the yeah. best, the most starstruck I ever was was I got to meet Spielberg. Yeah. I got to pitch to Spielberg. And uh, and that was just like, that was nerve wracking. I'm not a nervous person. I've done this long enough. Uh, but there I get called in to pitch an original idea to, to Spielberg. He wants to make an action film. He doesn't, he's not happy that Aladdin had stolen a lot of his kind of style. Mm-hmm. So they said, we want an action animation film. And um, so uh, come up with a good one. We go in and uh, they take you to this video game room where you're playing video games that like haven't been invented yet. I mean, it's like it's Spielberg, right? He is like the mm-hmm. coolest stuff. They have a whole restaurant there. You know, you want something to eat? I'm like, no, I'll probably throw it up. So <laughs> finally they come to get you and they walk you down to see him. And I'm literally, it's like the scene in the Green Mile where I'm walking down the hallway and it's getting longer. And I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm about to go to my execution. Yeah. yeah. You go in and there's Steven Spielberg and like two other people and we're sitting in a boardroom and I'm like, holy cow, it's freaking Steven Spielberg. He's got like a sweater on and his beard and all that. Seeing like a tall chair and he turned around. Uh, yeah, he's, <laughs> he's just sitting in the chair and uh, and I end up sitting, so I sit like right here, like, like with me to you, not even closer. And so he he turns and he gives me 100% of his attention. Wow. And I, and, and so first I say to him, um, I'm nervous, and I, and it's the first time I've ever been nervous. I go, I, so I say, I'm just gonna tell him I'm nervous, and I say, I, I just gotta tell you, friend, I'm a little bit nervous here. I've never, you know, I grew up on your films. I didn't want to sound like you're like you're an old man and I'm a kid. I just said, I grew up in your films. They're really, you know, and as a as a former film student, as a uh, to be sitting with you pitching you a story is a little bit on the intimidating side. Ah, oh, no, no, no. And he starts to tell me the story. He goes, so Bob Zemeckis. He tells me a story that Bob Zemeckis told him. Bobby, Bob Zemeckis, like me and Steven and Bob go out for beers, right? Yeah. And he starts to tell me this story. And, and now I'm out of my body because I'm like, he's telling me a story. But I, I'm like, Steven Spielberg is talking to me like he, we're just pals. Yeah. And he's telling me the story that Bob Zemeckis told him. And I'm like, I have no idea. What's, what I heard, I heard was blah, 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 blah. Because <laughs> he's talking to me and I'm, not, I'm just out of body. And then I focus on the ground. He's dropped his pen. And, I, and I'm thinking, I got to steal that pen. <laughs> because <laughs> he's not going to buy this story. So. <laughs> I, I need, you gave up that early. <laughs> I, 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 need, I need a souvenir. That, uh, that eBay hadn't really been invented yet, so it was like uh, it was just going to be for me. And, he, and now I hear his story coming to an end. I'm like, oh my god, it's time for me to talk. So I, uh, I, I, um, I go into my pitch, and it's coming out beautifully, and it's just flying along. And I've had horrible pitches with horrible people. And he's just like, uh, and he's listening, and he and he pauses once or twice to ask a question, but like a smart question, like why is this happening and all that. And at the end of the pitch, he goes, "I like it, let's buy it." And and, and I'm looking at him like, "Don't you have to ask somebody?" I'm like, "I don't want to talk about you." Spielberg doesn't have to ask anybody, you know. Yeah, here's your pen back. Yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, he, he goes, "Yeah, I think well, I think we'll buy it." And then I go to lunch, and I get a phone call in the middle of lunch. Yes, they bought it. I mean, they literally bought it, yeah. and uh, so next day I'm working for Spielberg, which meant they didn't pay a lot, so I had to pick his kids up at school, mow his lawn. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I was working for him, and we wrote the script, and it was great. It's called uh, The Urban Legend. It precedes the actual horror film, The Urban Legend. It was about, um, it was kind of a, a guy who finds out that his father was a superhero, and his father before, his grandfather before him going back 5,000 years. And it's his job to be a superhero now. But he's like a rich playboy. He's like Bruce Wayne if Bruce Wayne wasn't a superhero, mm-hmm. like a, just a dick. And, uh, and then he kind of gets the call to, to, to rise up. And it took place kind of in an alternate 1930s. It was a cool-ass screenplay. We wrote it, and we handed it in. And the next day, Spielberg announced um, DreamWorks. Damn. And everything that, we, that he was working on prior mm-hmm. went what? to the shelf. So it is sitting on a shelf at DreamWorks or Universal, those are the two who own it. And I don't know, about 10 years ago, I talked to my lawyer. I said, hey, can you just find out what the status is? Like, can we buy it back? Whatever. So he calls, he goes, yeah, Universal doesn't, can't find it. I mean, what do you mean they can't find it? He goes, they literally can't find it in their records. I'm like, I got a check. I got a contract. He goes, they can't find it. I'm like, okay, so I'm going to go try to sell it. They'll find it the day I resell it. So all I'm saying right now is if you work at DreamWorks or you work at Universal, and you can go find the urban legend by Ron Mead and Jim McClain. 
written for Spielberg, read that script. It's the best damn script I ever wrote. And, uh, and it and is... Don't sell it on eBay. <laughs> no, read it and go call Spielberg and say, hey, Steve, remember your buddy Ron, the guy who did not take your pen? Yeah. <laughs> you hear that, Tiana? Find yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> Tiana, who works over at uh, yeah. DreamWorks Animation. I wanted to ask, um, like, what were your influences for you? Because, like, you know, like, modern day influences for writing, you know, are a lot of, like, there's Niga, a lot Niga. of them. Yeah. Uh, what were your kind of, like, influences for, like, getting into it? Like, you, you were like, I love this script. This, this script is, like. Like something you'd reread over and yeah. over. Oh, okay. So tier. one of the neat things, when I was working at Universal especially, I'd, I'd worked for a TV movie company before that, but the scripts there were really bad. They were TV movies. They were like Disease of the Week. But when I was working at Universal, we'd get all the scripts. You know, again, a, a, a spec script comes in, you read them, and everyone's reading it. And uh, so I read some great scripts, and there were two that were just amazing. One of them was called Romeo Must Die. They made the movie with Gary Oldman. And, uh, uh, but the screenplay was the best screenplay I'd ever written. I didn't write it. I'm sorry. I ever read. <laughs> I wish I'd written it. <laughs> Romeo Must Die. And it was just a great screenplay, mediocre film. And the other, and why am I blanking on it? It's by um, the guy who wrote Sandlot. Um, they made it into a movie uh, with Elijah Wood, uh, two little kids. Uh, oh, Lord oh, of the Rings? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Radio Flyer. Oh. Radio Flyer again. Uh, Radio uh, Flyer is like the, uh, the wagon. The right? wagon, yeah. yeah. It's about, and that that's uh, it's an element in the story. Uh, Radio Flyer by David Mickey Evans, and he had written Sandlot, and he's a great writer. He actually went to Loyola. Oh. Um, and so, um, uh, I, this script was one of the best. This, the other great script I ever read. So these are the two that I hadn't sold anything yet, but that was the bar for me. Having read good scripts, they were not made into great movies, but they were the best two screenplays I'd ever written. Prior to that, you know, what I hadn't really read much, you know, um, I'd seen movies and I grew up on, you know, loving science fiction and yeah. action and stuff like that. How was Romeo is Dead? How was the Romeo film Must was, Die? Romeo Must Die? Yeah. How, Romeo Must Die. Ro, Romeo yeah. Must Die. Um, How did you, was the film just not executed well? It, is that what it was? It just, and this is common, I think, it just did not live up to the quality of the screenplay. It was a really good screenplay. You almost felt like, how could they mess this up? Yeah. And then they just, it just wasn't that good. I mean, go watch it. It's still good. Yeah. Um, uh, Lena Olin, I think, is in it, and uh, she's the bad guy, and uh, Gary Oldman uh, is Romeo, and it's about like a crooked cop kind of thing, but it's just really good. How'd you come across the screenplay before the film? Well, those screenplays actually had traction. Oh, uh, wow. uh, okay. They were spec scripts, and they had made it around. And, and back in the day, uh, at the studios, you know, when a, when a script, okay, so when a, a hot spec script came around, um, they got faxed around. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah a fax. Mm. So, you know, like a hot script would come around and someone would sneak, take it apart, run into the fax room and fax it to their buddy at another studio. So over, you know. One hour oh, later. Oh, <laughs> two hours later. That's crazy. And, and it was on fax paper back then, which is like translucent paper. Oh, so my. then you took that to the copy machine. And by now it's been copied of a copy of a copy and everything was like muddy. And <laughs> um, so they were, there was an underground kind of uh, assistants got to see stuff by selling, uh, not selling, but, but sending stuff to each other. And that continues to this day. Once things went online, it's the assistants in Hollywood who have the pulse, who know what's going on. And they, you know, so by the way, those are the people you treat well. Whenever you guys get into a room, the guy getting you coffee, he could be me or you. And someday he's going to be somebody or she's going to be somebody. When you yeah. worked the assistant job, were you out like, were you out really saying, like, I want to be a writer? This is temporary? Because, like, I see job listings now for, like, Emerson. They're like, you you want to be an assistant, but you have to want to be a manager. I'm like, I don't want to. I well, want to uh, be a star. Well, <laughs> yeah. But I do want a job. <laughs> I, 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 I was happy to be an assistant because I wanted, I needed money. Yeah. And it was, a, it was nice to have a job that was paying and, and paid nicely. Um, I um, was happy to be an assistant because I was meeting people, met agents, producers, and all the people. And I was very careful. Uh, not to ingratiate, not to say, I'm a writer. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, because when I first got to LA, my first job actually was a tour guide at Universal Studios. Oh, hey. Uh, oh, yeah. I could do this all day long. I could <laughs> tell you left and right. Um, and everyone there was what we called an MAW, model, actress, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, the first thing they would leave with is, oh, I'm a director or I'm yeah. a writer. And I'm like, really? Because you're a tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I learned really right away, don't put your your wish out there as your title. Yeah. So I was very careful when I was at Universal because I was in the right place. Um, and I did not, and my, my, my boss knew I was a film student and that was good. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons she hired me, I think also. And, um, but I didn't put it in her face every day. Hey, guess what I'm writing? Want to read some pages? 
I waited. I waited till something was done. I did show her that first script. It was okay. It wasn't the greatest. Um, and I did show her the second script, which she didn't act on and yeah. Columbia bought. Yeah. Um, but I did not, I didn't tell everybody what I was doing. But I also want to make sure people knew I wasn't like this 25 year old guy whose aspiration was to be an assistant. Yeah. yeah. So what are, what are you telling people then? Like, how are you yeah. interacting when you're not? I made him know that I was a film student okay. more than anything else. And I always tell that to my students in my class when you're a film student, it's a nice safety net. Yeah. Because people trust film. They think you've been vetted. You know, you're a film yeah. student at COC. Oh, COC vetted you. Yeah. Uh, and so they'll open a door for you. I'm a film student. Come on in. Um, and, um, and, you know, because there are a lot of crazy people in Hollywood. Yeah. And so uh, so saying I was a film student showed them I was motivated. It also let them know it wasn't my goal in life to be yeah. answering phones and getting coffee. And, and, and that was helpful. Because then when I, I met the right people and they took an interest in me, they knew there was something more in yeah. me. And then I had something to show them. Uh, if, if, again, if I, you, if I write a screenplay and I show it to you and it's good and you show it to the next guy, even if you don't get money in it, you get props for being the guy who you know yeah. passed it on. So everyone wants a piece of the action. Yeah. yeah. That's well. Dang, I feel like we can't really uh, – like I remember like I was told like if you want like a specific job for the money, don't mention what you actually want to do. And it's hard to do now with like – if you find me on Instagram, there's dick jokes. Yeah. I yeah. want to do stand-up. <laughs> I can't say I just only want to edit. Even though, like, I'm interested, you know, but, like, yeah. that's not the long-term goal, so it's, like, harder to hide. Well, I don't believe necessarily in hiding. I actually have this – I subscribe to the idea that you need to tell people what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of people out there, like, you know, they'll find me. They ain't going to find you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to tell people what you want to do. I would like to be a stand-up comic. I want to be an actor. I know it's embarrassing to say I want to be an actor because I want to be famous. But if you're working toward it, then there's no, no shame. You know, if you're taking the classes, there's no shame in that. I did let people know I wanted to be a screenwriter. That's why I was in film school. Um, but I didn't wear it on my sleeve. I was, yeah. It wasn't every conversation because you don't want to talk to that guy more than five minutes. Yeah. 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 I think like the modern day version of that is like, like, I don't know, one of us like just posting it or making something and then like putting it online yeah. and then for people to see and get, gaining a portfolio of that. And like, that's kind of like something that you could show for as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Cause that, that's kind of like what I did with like, the, like the documentary work. Like I, I, I'm not really one to like show off or anything yeah. like that, but I just, you know, did my thing. I started making this little pile of stuff and then made a little, made a website. And when people asked or if I could inquire about things relating to jobs, I used to be like, here's a link to my, yeah. my well, website. I, I love what, I, what you've done. And, and I will also say that I love the world you guys live in. I kind of, I mean, I did good. I got lucky on my, in, in my low tech world, but the ability to promote yourself yeah. and, 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 and build podcasts and, and, and be a successful TikToker or do any of the things, uh, is amazing. Um, and you know, I, I applaud it now, you know, I, I, I love TikTok, mm -hmm. but I, I, but I, you know, and I get a lot of the stupid stuff and I'm like, you know, or, or the literally clickbait, but there are some super talented people. You're from Michaela, I, I think is, I mean, her and Jack O'Shea, I think it is, right? Jack the Pool Boy TV, shout out. Yep. Yes. Yeah. No, but that, I think they're two of the most talented people on TikTok. And I'm, I'm often sharing that with like friends and family, like these guys are funny and they should have a TV show. Yeah. I yeah. mean, to me, a network should have jumped on those two yeah. and they're said they, they need a, a 8, 30, 9 o'clock TV show. Yeah. They'll get it. I hope they do. Uh, I would watch it. So yeah. It's no one else is on their team. It's just them two writing, directing, editing. You know, yeah. Like, well, the beauty of that. And so, hey, I loved I was like, damn, they got them on, the, on their podcast. Pretty impressive. But more so than that, uh, that's what I'm talking about, is like people who are able to embrace technology today and turn it into something for themselves and not just do it like, you know, it's not like boob shots or something. Yeah. Yeah. What's wrong with those? <laughs> <laughs> it's too hey, easy. I, I guess I'm not going to show you my portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> Put those away, mister. <laughs> now, it's funny because TikTok must know my age and a, a man of a certain, mm. you know, age. Uh, um, and it's like, it's constantly sending me like boob stuff, you know, like, and, and so I'm like, you know, watching it and, you know, getting some funny stuff or some cool stuff about you know, whatever. And then like boob stuff and like, Every time that happens, someone's walking right past me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, I swear. It's, a, it's an algorithm. It's not me. And he's not swiping away. Yeah. Really, so. No. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Save for later. <laughs> and my wife goes, I'm the same age. I don't get the booby ladies. I'm like, well, you know, TikTok is just picking on me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do? I like boob. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. But. All right. We're at like around an hour or so. Uh -huh. um, but uh, Shoot for two more. Two more. Yes. <laughs> now, there, is there anything else um, 
that you guys wanted to talk about? Oh yeah, didn't you? Uh, yeah, no. Didn't you pitch to Weinstein? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I got to. How about some horror stories? Let's, yeah. let's take yeah. it down a notch. Okay, yeah. give me some some dark lighting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, uh, we'll, we got that, that for you a bit. Yeah. So yeah. uh, Save so your story for us. I've got. Um, you know, I had I told you the good story, the best. Uh, Spielberg is the top of the. Yeah. There's no story that gets better. That's cool. But there are dark stories. There are stories that get bad, um, really bad. Too. So I'll start with medium bad, and then, uh, like the time Harvey Weinstein raped me. Uh, <laughs> oh. Well, fi- I was wearing a costume. <laughs> Let me qualify that financially. Okay. <laughs> um, Trigger warning. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, um, he taught us. <laughs> we, we we pitched this animated story, which is just the best pitch I've ever uh, come up with, and it was called um, Bombido, and it was about a bull. I might even have pitched it when you were in my screenwriting class. It's just this, it's this great freaking story about a bull, who it's Top Gun with a bull, and uh, and, and it's all about the the um, the bullfighting arenas in Spain, and this bull's like he doesn't give a damn, he's too cool, and then he ultimately finds himself. Anyway, it's a great. I remember that. You yeah, use it, it as like a pitch example. Yeah, and I use it as yeah. a pitch example because it's the best pitch I've ever done. And um, so we go and we pitch it to Weinstein's people, not to Weinstein himself, but to his people. And is and we pitch, and it's a great pitch, and we're producers, and we get the whole team, and they buy it in the room. Again, that's rare, wow. but they buy it in the room. This guy's the president of production of the Weinstein Company, and he goes, and he has the power to buy it in the room, so they buy it. And I'm like, you know, I'm counting the money. I'm thinking, that's a car. That's a, you know. And uh, celebrate, probably go out to dinner, the whole bit, blah, blah, blah. The next morning, yeah, um, Harvey Weinstein hated the idea. Uh-huh. He just hated the idea, and they're canceling the deal. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, you know, it was, it, it was a horror story in that I lost money. Yeah. Uh, Did you, like, make any, like, like, did you invest in anything? Like, like no, I didn't have right time now? to buy a car. So. Okay. Did they just give you a check already? Or like, <laughs> no, no, no. It takes two okay. months to, oh, okay, to okay, negotiate. Okay. But the point is, someone so buys case. it in the room. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, legally, that was a contract of, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, it just, it was a crusher because yeah. it would have been a really sweet deal. I mean, it would have been worth a lot of money. It would have been yeah, made since it's an original idea. We would have had a piece of the everything, yeah, and and it never happened. So, but he, yeah, Harvey just hated it. Uh, I, I don't know what, you know, maybe it, it, maybe he, who knows? So that was Harvey. He screwed me over. Um, I had a, I had a run in with his brother, Bob, who's kind of on the same level as that guy. Yeah. They can't hurt me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, what are they going to do? Come on. <laughs> uh, his brother, Bob, we were pitching to him and, and, and I had some notes on the table and he grabs the notes out, off the table and he starts reading them. And then I go, well, those are my notes. Can I have them back? And he goes, shut up. <laughs> and he just, he just sits there, and then for the next fifteen minutes, he just reading my notes, and it's me and like six of his development boys, and no less. We were in a hotel room because <laughs> the Weinstein's don't live here, yeah. so they would rent like the top floor of a hotel. So that's all those creepy Harvey stories you heard. Oh my god! We were in the room where it happened. Um, <laughs> no bad. <laughs> the seats were the seats were sticky, but <laughs> <laughs> so we uh, so. Uh, that would, my, you know, the, it, no big story other than the fact that the guy told me to shut up. Yeah, he then absolutely. read my notes for 15 minutes and then told me he didn't like it. And uh, so it was just, it was rude. It was not how you Dang. do a pitch. But um, so here's the story, though, a uh, different story. So um, I told you about Video Killed the Radio Star, the MTV story. So we, uh, we, 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 we had this great woman. Her name is Janet Burroughs. And Janet was, she's the one we came to with this idea. And Janet loved it. I mean, it was a great idea. We, remember, I grew up on MTV. And anyone of my age or even a few year, years younger, that was all you did in the 80s was watch MTV, hours. So it was a perfect idea for a movie to talk about the origin of it. It would be a great HBO movie, right? Be a uh, um, behind-the-scenes kind of film. So with Janet, we went to like, every studio and pitched this. And every studio passed. Um, uh, HBO, they all passed. They didn't want to like go up against MTV. We were worshiping MTV. We weren't trashing. We were like, this is like awesome. Mm -hmm. Finally, TNT was interested. So we had a big meeting set up with TNT. It wasn't the biggest channel, but it was going to make them, they were making movies. So um, we get there. It's, uh, and um, the producer shows up, the producer's assistant shows up, and the meeting's at, and Janet hasn't shown up. And I'm like, "Um, well, we got to wait for Janet. It's really her project. And uh, they, um, they go, no, no, Janet said to start without her. So we do the pitch. TNT likes it. They're already predisposed to buy it. It's happening. Um, so it was really kind of a formality pitch. And uh, we finished the pitch. We go out into the lobby. 
And I could see the producers a little agitated, a little nervous, the assistants sweaty. And I'm like, I don't even know why this guy's even here. And it's, and the executive TNT is with us. And the producer then says, Janet was murdered this morning. Janet was murdered that morning. She was still on the floor of her kitchen. And we're in there pitching the story. And I'm looking at the guy like, why in the hell are we even here? And the executive from the studio is like, why are we having this meeting? And the producer's statement was, well, it was really hard to set this meeting up and I didn't want to like reschedule it. And I'm like, oh, if that's not bad mojo for a project, that's I don't know what crazy. is. So poor Janet, uh, she lived in Eagle Rock. Uh, she was a great gal. Everyone in Hollywood loved her, was murdered. She lived across the street from a crack house oh my uh, or God. some some place where some stuff was going on. And I guess she had been calling the cops on it. And uh, someone broke in. And it, the story's even worse. She was pregnant. Oh uh, um, but um, so it was really sad. Her funeral was was devastatingly sad and but the, it was I was so stunned that I was in a, I felt so mercenary I felt so gross yeah. that I'm in there pitching this movie because this producer feels like I really can't reschedule this one you know yeah. this was hard to get this 10 a.m. slot um Eddie uh, so that was creepy that was so, sad yeah. what, what happened with the project after that uh, well, that was the one of the ones I told you we 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 did some work on it, and then ultimately it died. Yeah, and that's the one. Another, that's the second script I ever did the overnight rewrite. Yeah, because I was afraid they would make it again somewhere yeah. someday, and um, it never got made. And it's another great idea, um, but uh, I would say the moment we had that meeting, yeah, it was done. that 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 film was done. Yeah. That was oh, dead. Man. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, so but man. that's Hollywood. Like, yeah. it's, there's some it's dark the shit. Yeah, and there's some dark people who will. Yeah. Have a meeting the day this girl was still on the floor. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Terrible. I'm a silly Sorry, guy. I didn't mean to bring you. <laughs> <laughs> fuck, Ron? I didn't mean to. I didn't Yo, mean, I, 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 this I, is a comedy podcast. I, I know. I, I should have led with that one and yeah. then. And then oh. <laughs> Who's there, Omar? Who's there? Oh. Yeah! Wow! Wow! Uh, no, that, that, that was a great story. We're just, yeah. Like, so, yeah, I was like, like, <laughs> I was like, should I find a punchline? I'm like, I don't feel like no, that's right. I, I know Dang how to kill her. I'm gonna tell that's that story. Killed, I guess. <laughs> tell me next time you're doing stand up, I'll I'll get up before you and tell that story. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now all this. Yeah. That was my dad. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah we we have a segment we kind of want to run by you. All right, cool. Yeah, we think you're gonna like this. Actually, we're not. Oh, there. sorry. Yeah. 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 It says, uh, we have a new segment for you brought to you by a really, really, really big, fa big fan of the show, John Barracuda. This segment is, would you write this? Okay. I love that. All right. So we're going we're gonna to throw you rates, and then we're going to throw you plots. When you just tell uh, us yes or no, you can kind of give us a little bit of Would I write it? Okay. Yeah. All right. So $400,000. Oh. <laughs> so directed the by answer the, already is yes. <laughs> <laughs> directed by the director of your choice. Yeah. But the main character has to be a talking dog. With a Hitler mustache. Oh God! Would I write that? You know, um, yeah. I, I would tell you that ten years ago, I would have easily written that. Yeah. And now, um, people don't get the joke sometimes on yeah. things like that. And I, I just saw a lady, a, a, a weather lady, who had to rep uh, apologize for bringing a cat on the weather report named Kittler. It was a cat with a Hitler mustache, <laughs> 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 and she didn't. Get the joke. She didn't. She just thought it was a cute cat yeah. and, and didn't understand the name Kittler. Uh, <laughs> and, and she's like, "I'm so sorry." And so, uh, I would say, I, it's sad as I, again. I hate to say no to money, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking, how can that blow up my face? That could blow up my yeah, face. Yeah. Fair. You could have just said it's like a Charlie Chaplin mustache. Yeah. Was, well, you're right. But, yeah. But he hates Jewish people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a funny, silent comic, but he's a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, speaking of not 200K, yeah. name remains anonymous, but it's a Kanye West biopic. And it has to be approved by Kanye West himself. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know, I, Kanye is not of my generation. I do believe that um, he's an interesting character, though. Yeah. He's an interesting dude. The, the only problem I have with that would be him approving it. Yeah. Because uh, uh, his story is definitely... I, I don't... Look... I, I'm, now I'm going to be an old man for a few minutes. I don't get what you people see in, in that Kanye. Yeah. My sons love him. My youngest son, Rory, he's just like 
you know, Kanye, but he's coming to like, okay, Kanye, I love Kanye, but maybe I need to distance myself. Yeah. I like him. I don't like his music yeah. though. Yeah. Oh, you don't like <laughs> his music? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's not my joke. I heard I like it somewhere else. Uh, yeah. That's <laughs> I like his guest appearance. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> not my uh, joke. <laughs> maybe I would do it if Kanye would get on his meds and then I could yeah. do it. Uh, I, this is a funny story. I actually once met with a rapper. Oh uh, my God, but that was his name. Um, Blueface? No, the problem was, this was years ago, and um, he went up against, uh, uh, his name will come to me in a second, I met with him, he was hot for five minutes, and then um, he was signed with, with like, uh, Diddy or something like that, and, they, and he didn't like his contract, and he decided he was only going to do spoken word engagements, he wasn't going to rap anymore, and he literally stopped rapping, and... Uh, um, Oh, his name. Listen to me. I'm like so old and white. I can't remember his name. But uh, it was like 2000s. Uh, yeah, uh, his name will come to me in a minute. But um, he 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 was hot. He was rising. We met with him. We were had some ideas to pitch by him, and the, the studio was gonna be hot. Him, and then he literally said, "I won't rap anymore." And I thought it was like a Prince thing, where like he's just carrying on. But he literally stopped rapping, and I, and and that was the end of him. Um, wow. uh, his well, name will come to me in a minute. But yeah, Frank Ocean, <laughs> Martin Luther King. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, give me another. I, uh, uh, all right. A Kanye with an asterisk, maybe. All right, okay. 300K. Yeah. Write whatever you want with whoever you want attached, but you got to be credited as Tiberius Rex. <laughs> I don't know who that is. I don't, is, that like, is, that like a porn, is that like a porn star or something like that? No, it's Tiberius Sex. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. I, um, I, I once turned down a project because I didn't want my name to be on it. And I realized I didn't have to use my own name. What the hell did I, why did I turn down money? Uh, a, a friend of mine was producing me about fish that can walk on land and kill people. Oh, that's fire. Uh, well, like I didn't think too. At the, time, at the time, I'm like, that's a stupid idea. I don't want to be associated with it. And then like six months later, I'm in the video store because they still existed. And there's the movie. It was called Frankenfish. <laughs> and he made it. <laughs> and now I'm like, who's the idiot? I'm the guy who didn't take the paycheck. And I could have been Tiberius Rex for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you do it? Oh yeah, I do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fifty K. Deep... Why are they getting cheaper? <laughs> hey, it's a studio, all right? Yeah. <laughs> a deep you're, you're Although that tomorrow, is like the real world. Like your <laughs> yeah. quote gets less and less. So. It's a fifty K a deeply dramatic Frank Sinatra biopic, but it has to star Kevin Hart as Frank Sinatra. Uh okay. You know what though? Look at the look at the Hamilton casting we've been doing. Uh, uh, uh Hamilton casting is happening everywhere. There's a play in Los Angeles now called 1776, which is about the founding father. It's a very famous Broadway play in the uh, in the early 70s, and still remains popular. It was a movie, and now it's all uh, multicultural, all females, mm. and uh, they call it Hamilton casting. That's literally what they call it. And uh, even Marilyn Monroe movie with Anna Anna Darmus, yeah. she's Angel. Spanish, yeah. yeah, and she used this, her accent as Marilyn Monroe, right? I didn't yeah. see the film, but well, I should. Um, so the answer is, yeah, I'll write it. <laughs> it may not be good. I like yeah. think Kevin Hart's hilarious, but uh, yeah. but we'd say up front, yeah. it's Hamilton casting. Go with it. All right. I want to play as like his assistant or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right, for a hundred k, you get to write the sequel to Goodfellas oh. with Martin Scorsese, but it's called Bad Fellas. <laughs> That's not such a bad That's title. That's not bad. That actually sounds yeah. pretty cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I got. I will honestly tell you. That title would have been thrown out in one of the meetings. It may not yeah. actually land, but that sounds like one of the studio executives to get his voice heard. Yeah. What do you think about bad fellas? And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Scorsese would look at him like, "Why are you in here?" But yeah. um, uh, oh, I, hey, listen, to be in the same room with Scorsese, yeah. you know, uh, uh, yeah. like cat fellas. Yeah, <laughs> I'll write about mobster cats. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's it's ten million dollars, and it's a sequel to your hit movie Robots, <laughs> but you have to reprise Robin Williams' role. And the public will be informed that he recorded the lines right before he passed away when it's really just you, Ron Mita. <laughs> and the whole film centers around his character. You also have to direct it and be in charge of crafties. And your third cousin God. has to write the whole first act. Ah, $100 million, huh? My third cousin. Um, I, I, uh, I've just done Ancestry and Me. I know a lot of my third cousins. They're, they're Italian, so it's going to be in a different language. We'll start with that. <laughs> uh, but... Um, you know, the sequel to Robots, we were hoping there would be a sequel to Robots, and they talked about it, but uh, it, it never came about. So, uh, yeah, I would do that in a second. Yeah, I, I would do all that. As far as, uh, I probably could mimic uh, Robin Williams' voice. Uh, you know, 
Yeah. yeah. I think Robin Williams, just before he died, very depressed. His yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, monotone. Yeah. So, yeah. y'all. Yeah. All right, I, I got one more. I got yeah. one more. All right. One million dollars. You write a war movie about a soldier who gets dishonorably discharged for letting his partner, like, shoot a civilian in order to save 10 more. And years later, he gets a second chance to be on SEAL Team 6 to go kill Osama bin Laden. But then he finds out that his, his ex-partner, his best friend, is working for al-Qaeda as bin Laden's right hand. Are you pitching me an actual story that you, you thought of? That's actually not too bad of an idea. That's what I was saying. See? Yeah. Good job. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you have all the all the necessary twists and turns and yeah. characters in that story uh, to make it work. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that actually... That doesn't sound familiar to you at all. Oh, is that my story? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. That's literally SWAT. That's <laughs> not SWAT. How is that not SWAT? Hold on. He shoots the... They shoot the civilian in the beginning, right? Oh, oh. They shoot oh, the hostage. Yeah, okay, that was like, okay. They get discharged. All right, all right, hold on. All right, all right. Okay. Demoted, <laughs> fired... That's better than the opening of SWAT. <laughs> <laughs> the opening of SWAT was uh, was was. Uh, here's that's some, based off an actual robbery, right? Well, well just the opening sequence. Oh, yes, yeah. there was a called the North Hollywood Shootout. We were writing the movie at the time, and there's this insane shootout. You got to Google it. Yeah, uh, it was in North Hollywood. It was just like crazy shootout right there on live TV, and we actually recorded it. We actually put the SWAT music to it and then we'd send it to the studio like, yeah, this is what our movie's going to look like. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, then they, real and, and then they put it, it wasn't in the draft that I had written, but the director of the movie uh, loved it and he added that sequence. That's why yeah. I didn't recognize it. But um, SWAT uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, as much as I like the movie and as popular as the movie is, uh, they made several changes that I didn't like. Yeah. And uh, one of those is they added in a training sequence. And as a writer... I hate training sequences. Uh, they're the worst part of any movie. You guys Star Wars fans? Yeah. The worst part of Star Wars is when Luke goes off with uh, Yoda and spends like half a movie running through a cave and like, uh, yeah. you know, it's like it's, training sequences suck. Yeah. We want to see our heroes do shit. Yeah. And uh, in SWAT, we had written this really cool sequence where they, uh, there was a hijacked plane and that's actually where they ended up getting the guy that ultimately is the part of the story. They changed that movie to putting together the SWAT team and then practicing uh, for the half the movie, there's a whole 20 minutes spent on a on a on them in a with paintball guns in a in an airplane pretending to catch uh, you know to, to take out uh, fugitives. And I'm like, why not just do the real thing? Nobody yeah. wants to see uh, um, training sequences, and and that's the biggest problem with SWAT is the biggest part of the story, which should be the first act break where the guy says, I will give a hundred million dollars to anyone who gets me out of Los Angeles, and then the shit hits the fan. That should happen at page 30, the first act break. Yeah. But the way they added in all those training sequences, it happens at page 60, halfway through the movie. The pacing in the first half of the movie completely sucks. Yeah. Uh, so, But this is the case of being a writer. No movie that you ever wrote that gets made is what you wrote on the page. Yeah. They change it along the way. And you got to learn to just deal with it. Yeah. yeah. Dang. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. Golly. That's, That's Mary Kate. Kate. That's, That's Mary Kate. Kate. That's, That's Mary Kate. Kate. Am I supposed to join in? No, you're <laughs> okay. <good. laughs> I'm not a big Mary, Mary Kate and Ashley, or just Mary Kate. Ooh. Someone's brought that up. Yeah. I yeah. should have yeah. said that because the song's about boobs. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so just that. one boob. My phone is here, and it's picked up that algorithm now. It'll be also, <laughs> boobs, fault, big boobs. Yeah. Robots too. Robots too. <laughs> yeah. it's my TikTok but, is gonna be about Mary Kate with the boob. I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, okay. As you know, our podcast is called "I'm Gonna Come Clean." Yes. So we have this little segment and we give you an opportunity to come clean about something you maybe have never said out loud oh, or, shit. or even like on camera or anything. Uh, oh, I got to think here. Um, it, could think, it could be anything. It could be, um, I mean, you said a lot of stories already. It could mm -hmm. be a story. Yeah, that's, I've said stories that, that yeah. I've never said. To, never I've said them to my students, but I've never said them in a, in a recorded yeah. environment, especially the one about Janet, which yeah. was a sad well, story. Yeah. Um, but um, a good one. Uh, yeah, I should have saved it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, up, up, up. Um, <laughs> Uh, I Take your time. Yeah, yeah. Give me a second. Uh, uh, like a true confession here. Yeah, like yeah. yeah be, yeah. be honest. Um, People also do bathroom breaks during this if you want to. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm going to do a bathroom break. So you you want to like, think about it? Yeah, give me two seconds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Two gonna seconds? Yeah, you, better, you better run, bro. <laughs> <Yes. Done. laughs> I, think just, I think just stick around for a second. Let's just, yeah, sure. yeah, let's just finish the segment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, are, are, oh, you have some? Okay. I got a good one. It's not a great story. and I, But I... So I, I, I'm really tight with uh, my high school friends. Mm -hmm. 
like six or seven of us that we still get together um, periodically. And um, one of our friends, Tom, uh, a great guy. Uh, we, we all grew up together in Syracuse, New York. And then we've all, and then, you know, we used to call each other, like one of our friends had a, a business line, so we would call on the phone and do, and then texting and phones came around, you know, so, so all our lives we've been in contact. But Tom was the only one of us who had an Android phone. And uh, we all had, you know, and so for, for the last 10 years, we've had a really great group chat going. But every time you send a picture, Tom's phone would just fuck everything up. Yeah. The picture would go six different places. I didn't get the message. It splits the thing. So we're kind of growing to hate Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love this guy, right? You, you like hear that, brother. Dylan? Yeah. Dylan has an Android. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, uh, people hate you. You just don't know. Oh, it. I <laughs> Only we would tell Tom, uh, we hate you because of your phone, but we love Tom. Uh, and um, uh, Tom ha had uh, heart problems, and he died. Uh, <laughs> Sadly, I did, again. <laughs> and um, while it? we all, we wept, uh, we were all like, thank God Tom's gone. His phone is out of there. <laughs> so we? so uh, we, we, all, we, all, we all had to decide who was going to speak at his funeral. One of us, one of the six, and my friend Sean spoke, and he opened with that. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> Only it was a really Christian room, and uh, first he introduced us as Tom's, we're Tom's heathen friends, because Tom was kind of religious, the rest of us weren't. And uh, <laughs> and then he proceeded to tell the story of, you know, when Tom died, we were a little happy because our phones were working. So, uh, so, so how did it do in the room? Like, uh, the room was, they warmed up. Sean's a good yeah. speaker and he, he got it out, but it was too damn funny that he <laughs> opened with that. I was like, you're really not going to go there because this is a very conservative room and yeah. we're not those guys. Yeah. Um, he also... <laughs> He also let it slip that we would talk because Tom, like I said, was our only religious friend, and we would talk about Tom's invisible friend, which being Jesus. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, um, and yeah, I think he dropped that also in the speech no. about oh, uh, So um, at least I wasn't the guy making the speech. Yeah. But yes, Tom, when Tom died, there was a part of us that was like, yay, he's gone. Yeah, wow. Kind of beautiful. <laughs> so I, I told you that story that. to my students the week he died, and they, <laughs> and they looked at me like, oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> What was this? I was like four years ago, three years ago. I remember um, yeah. you would, what was it? It was like when we were in a screenwriting class yeah. and you're telling a story about Weinstein also. Oh. And then you're like, yeah. And then I was like, oh, Weinstein, please don't rape me. Uh -huh, just kidding. And then I was the only one laughing. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, it's funny in class. You got to be careful telling stories. I mean, I don't go too dark or too blue. I mean, I do tell these Hollywood warning stories, yeah. but um, you got you to tread carefully yeah. in class. Um, yeah, and, and, and you want to make sure that you're not offending anybody. Yeah. So, uh, But one good thing I could say, though, is, is kind of going bring it full circle, being at a public school, people come to, my kids come to me and they say, whether they're writing or making a film, can I use bad words? I'm like, <laughs> it's public school. You know, we don't edit you. We, yeah. you. we don't censor you. It's a great place to be because we let you be you. Yeah. You know, we don't want you to... The only person who's probably pushed the limit would be you. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> By that. Why? Because <laughs> I remember when he screened his short film, oh. and you were all part of it. Yeah. Uh, Wait, which uh, one? Oh, geez, there was the other bars, one. Right? Oh, bars. Yeah, bars. Um, um, what was the one with you in the parking lot acting a little bit? Uh, that was the same that was one. Bars. That was bars yeah. also. Okay. Yeah. Acting a little bit what? What? No, uh, light. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, but, it, it, but bars was great. Bars was offensive as anything. Um, <laughs> but you had to get the joke. And, and I know in talking to you, it's some people don't get the joke yeah. and, and that's difficult. And so I have to kill, coach my students. You can go where you want to go, but be careful. Uh, a, there are people who take offense. And my opinion is, um, you could still do that as an artist, uh, know that people will be offended and, and you probably don't want to engage them. Just, I'm sorry. No. It's not for you. It's not for you. It's at that point. I'm like, well, I'm laughing. Yeah. 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 Uh, again, it, you know, it wasn't horrific stuff. It was just... Uh, I remember um, I was scared when I was showing it before class. I was like, hey, guys, let me know what you think. And then after, I was like, is anyone offended? We ended up showing it in the student showcase. We showed it. It was, the, we did, it was first. It was the class when I TA'd yeah. your class. Yeah. And after, it was the student showcase. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. oh, hell yeah. Yeah. I think we all have, like, our own individual stories of, like, kind of, like, sweating bullets sure. in your class. Because, like, I know when I screened my first doc... Mm -hmm. I, I didn't really know. I think I messaged you saying like, hey, can we even make documentaries? <laughs> and I was like, I wanted to make something like this. Yeah. And like, yeah, sure. And then I remember like being really, really anxious because we, we didn't make that. And I just felt like 
I don't know. I feel like I was going to be like an outsider there. Yeah. No, uh, your your stuff is great. The thing you have to deal with when you're dealing with film students and and and, and the classes you guys went is, is the short attention span yeah. of a film student of a college student, uh, and and that includes me. Short yeah. attention span. And when you're going documentary, you're going slow. Yeah. And you were talking about very specific, like the first one you did was the the woods, uh, um, a beautiful, beautiful place. place. Yeah. And that's first of all, it's great because it's short. So that, yeah. that that's that was a great one to start with, and it was melodic and you had everybody just because your camera work was so amazing and and it was so it was almost comforting it was it yeah, almost felt like so sitting peaceful, on a beach yeah, yeah. like i want to take a nap i don't want to fall asleep in yeah it, but it was beautiful his vo my friend brady's oh, voice yeah. is like very like, yeah the way he warm, spoke is like radio yeah he should just like he should do like uh yeah, so spoken somehow. word things. Like I still remember like yeah. one of the first things you guys talked about because yeah. you asked him, you're like, or like you sat him down. Yeah. You said that you sat him down. I'm like, that, that wasn't, they, they didn't go through takes of that. Like he just sat no, down yeah. and started talking. Yeah. Like, yeah. And now it's, like so, like, but I can understand being nervous. You were showing something that was yeah. different. You know, most people are making stupid cliche stuff and uh, certainly going for the joke. Uh, that was beautiful. That was yeah. different. And I, had, in all my years of teaching, I hadn't seen a documentary. Yeah. I'd seen documentaries, but nothing like that. So that was a great start. But yeah. You got to be careful with student audiences. They're not real audiences, yeah. and they have yeah. a limited attention span. And I blame Sesame Street for that, yeah. <laughs> because Sesame Street gave you everything in five minute intervals. Think about it when you were a little kid. Yeah. You learned about the letter A or the number three or friend, and they did it for five minutes, and then they moved on. And over and and so everyone became used to getting information in five minutes. That's why I teach screenwriting. I'm like, you need new information every five minutes, yeah. but it doesn't mean as a filmmaker you have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. But just know that your audience. Yeah. It's a very short like attention span. To a little bit. Yeah, I've, and again, so I tell my students, if you're writing some commercial and you're trying to sell a script, a comedy, a drama, whatever, it needs to flow yeah. because yeah. even yeah. and studio executives have zero attention span. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, remember, that's how it is today. Yeah. Like, like everything's on YouTube and stuff. I work yeah. in like a YouTube right. environment now and we still kind of like run with that too because we need to like, we're like, this, just take this whole part out because this is just dragging. Like, we need to get, we, we got this, now we need to go to the next point, right? the next point. Yeah. So, like, you can't drag. Yeah. Right. Now, were, it no. was fun, like, screening shorts in your class because, mm. like, if it was good, you actually meant it. And if it was bad, we're like, yeah, we should. Yeah, that's that. a big take. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because, like, because I, because I went, yeah. when I went to, like, um, Emerson, everyone was like, yeah, I'd never get critiques. And I'm like, that's not good. Like, yeah. you would shit on yeah. work that needed to be shitted on. Yeah. And I'm like, that's I was, like, I was you know? very kind. Yeah, no, yeah. No, yeah. Not I shit, was, but, but like, yeah. you're, you're kind, honest, but you're yeah. honest. I, I, not I, shit, like, here's what I would do. And um, I tried to find something good about anything. Mm -hmm. The worst film. Oh, I love how you put that camera over there. Yeah. You know, so I find something. And and when I'm watching it, you know, in the first 30 seconds, this is a horrible film. Yeah. <laughs> but so, <laughs> so now my focus is what was good in here. Yeah. And I'm looking, I'm searching, got it. And I'll, I'll write these notes in the dark, which, by the way, when I turn the lights on, I gibberish. <laughs> so, it's a so, crossword. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm, I always try to come back with something positive. Um, and uh, there's been an occasion where it was just, I, the only times I really got angry was when the people, literally didn't do the job like they, they they handed in like just random footage and right. it wasn't even and then i'm like you didn't even try i'm yeah. surprised they even yeah. handed it in because like, yeah we would all watch it yeah so, like, in, like, in it like worse. a complete shock like yeah that. <laughs> you really don't give a yeah. fuck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and the best part though made you feel better like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. like well he's fine um so when i see that stuff i mean I, if i can't even find something to make a compliment about then you really failed you've really yeah. done a horrible job yeah. uh and, and um you know, it, it just, uh, and, and part of it is also, you know, uh, um, I always try to take some of those mediocre kids and stick them in with good guys. You guys, when I would put you on groups, I would definitely stick a couple of total lemons in with you because <laughs> they needed to learn from people who could do well. Yeah. And, and if I put them on their own, they weren't, yeah, the work wasn't going to get done. So, uh, so no vlog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, TikTok dance. Yeah. 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 We definitely learned a lot from yeah. the class. And I think that's like, um, like what you were saying, like, uh, we needed somebody to be just like real about yeah. it. Cause like, you know, if, if you don't say anything bad, then we're never going to really learn, I guess. Like right. you, you got to have some constructive criticism. Well, what I say up front in my, mostly in my film class, but even in screenwriting is, um, this class is about failure yeah. Yeah. and, and it doesn't mean failing in the class. It means coming in and making a shitty movie. Yeah. You tried, but you tried, but you did a bad job yeah. and the, the lighting was bad. The sound was bad. The, Actors, the actors are your friends, yeah. so they sucked, right? And um, and and the question is, when you finished and you handed it in, and we talked about it, and you didn't get the best vibe, what did you learn? And are you going to make those mistakes again next time? I feel from failure, you learn. I mean, my first student films were horrendous, yeah. and um, they got a little bit better. 
they were never great, uh, but um, but I learned each time about mistakes. So I I love it. and I say to my students, this is where you come to fail while you're in college because we have a safety net here, yeah. you know. But in Hollywood, and you guys are now getting into the real world, you fail in the real world, you get fired. Yeah, there's a lot of and, and it leaves a stain. Or stay unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so failure <laughs> failure is college is where you go to fail but learn. And, yeah. uh, and, and that's why I've, I really feel we offer that here. We offer a real nice safety net. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And you won't yeah. be in debt, you know. Yeah. Failing. And you won't be in debt. Yeah. You didn't cost your parents their house because you went to USC film school. Yeah. Hell no. Come to COC. We had the best toys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you yeah. got a tour of the gear the other day. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Story. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. COC like, like, I'm really repping yeah. this school. Like, yeah. I feel like I joking say, like, COC was crazy, but it really was like a good school. Yeah. Well, it, it, like, it, if you don't know exactly what to do or if you want to, like, yeah. refine. Yeah. Your craft and film, yeah. I feel. it's. Um, I always call it a sandbox. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was funny because um, the marketing department of the school asked for like a blurb. And I said, oh, it's like playing in a sandbox. They did not like that. They go, that, that it just sounds like children. I said, no, the point in the sandbox <laughs> is there's no, you can just do what you want. You can yeah. build what you want. And that's who we are here. We got great toys. Again, you guys saw the cameras that we were showing you the other day. Yeah. High-end stuff, professional level yeah. stuff. You take a class here at COC in film one, you're using like, 80% of the good stuff. And when yeah. you take film two, you're using yeah. the Cadillacs. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and and you can't get that at uh, at, at a four-year school until yeah. you're almost a senior. And even there, Dawson, you were at a... You were at a uh, Emerson. Emerson. Name dropping them. Right, but yeah, how Thanks many... for everything, y'all, but however, yeah. <laughs> <What> <laughs> I have some of, complaints. What kind of gear the, do they have there? I think the best they had might have been like an A7S three. Okay. Like there was so... And then like... There was like a complicating, complicated like running out system. Like yeah. it was students running it, and sometimes students would forget to like give the gear to students. Uh, and like some people would like not charge batteries would yeah. be misspent. Well, like something when here, students, Austin's when students it. run, it's also dangerous because your buddy gets the gear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here it's very well handed out. Yeah, it's, they have um, like sixteen black magics. They have yeah. like all sound. They have this podcast studio. Also, we're yeah. so honored to be the first ones to use yeah. it. This is yeah. so crazy, and, and it's we, moving to an even better facility yeah. in a couple of weeks. Yeah, so. yeah. and, then, and then we, we got Drew in a whole control room. Another is he place. Sleeping? Yeah. Yeah. Yourself, <laughs> hey, Drew, cut yourself. Yeah, Ooh, say hello. See the camera quality on that on that thing is kind of insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, we've there. got the toys yeah. and we've got the teachers, and you get the freedom. Yeah, and you, as you said, you don't go broke. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and and that's. Um, hey, can I pitch something real quick? Yeah, uh, so I mean, a class. So I teach screenwriting online. We we moved to online for screenwriting, um, and this kind of bummed me out because I like it in the classroom. You guys were there in the classroom. Yeah. It's interactive. Um, obviously, during COVID, we 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 did a lot of transition online and we've come back but screenwriting we left online because the students want to take it online there's two kinds of students there's those who are really just they work they're out in the real world they can't get to uh, college of the canyons in santa clarita so the online class was just like double the enrollment of the on the ground class and that class used to be when you guys took it, it was 35 you know it was yeah. overloaded so we moved them all to online and um so the neat thing is anyone listening to this anywhere in the united states can take my class in screenwriting yeah at College of the Canyon. So you pay more than, you guys are local, you wouldn't pay much at all, but even the out-of-state price yeah. is like nothing. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, to me, that class, I call it like Hollywood 101. It's because it, we don't talk just about screenwriting. We talk about yeah. getting into the business. The, it, you know, trying to like, this is where you start. Yeah. Uh, and, and the and the system I teach, 24 plot point systems, I'm the only one in the United States teaching this. Yeah. yeah. So um, you come here yeah. and, uh, and we'll, we'll get you started. Yeah. I yeah. think even too, just to kind of like shout out like your film class. Mm -hmm. I know like there's a lot of stuff you can learn on YouTube. And we even talked about this yesterday. Yeah. Just like like technical stuff isn't hard, especially once you start like actually working with it. But I think something that we can like we can very much like tip our hat to you about is like how you, you push us to be creative. Yeah. And, like you're very story driven and like that was the main thing you focus on. Well, lot, like two things to that. Class. One is, A, I'm not as technically advanced as you guys. Uh, the technology is coming fast and fierce. Remember, I went to film school with Bolex cameras and yeah. film and stuff like that. And yes, then, right. When we were training, you're like, yeah. hey, all this, you get that? And yeah. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, right. They came in to look at this facility. I'm like, there's a lot of buttons. I don't know what they do. <laughs> Uh, but these guys, but you guys are like, yep, I get it. I'm like, yeah. Uh, you made your you made your film thesis on film. Right? Uh, every film I ever made was on film. Yeah, uh, and uh, and wow. that was expensive. I used yeah. to and like you know, was in, I had to go to Photochem and all the labs and yeah. and and uh, oh my god, you know, you're married. My wife's working. I'm a film student. Hey, do you mind can, if we spend like four hundred dollars, which is a lot of money back then, on, on my student film? Yeah, that's just yeah. to get the print from the yeah. lab. And the, so it was terrible. It was a, a and. Um, it wasn't terrible, but it was expensive. And then the video era that you guys are in is amazing. The problem is the technology is changing so fast. The cameras we've got now, every year we get new cameras. And and I, I just get used to using one. And then suddenly like this 
next one comes in. But I'm fortunate because my students who come in, there's always about 30, 40% who have already yeah. been playing with cameras. And now the way YouTube works, the way the online tutorials work, I don't have to teach the camera yeah. itself. I want to spend my time teaching the story. Yeah. To me, my filmmaking class, my screenwriting class, it's all about story. Because if you don't have a story, I don't care what you do. Yeah. If you have a story, you can shoot it with your cell phone. Yeah. It'll be, be fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that we have good cameras, great. Make it fan, make it splashy, make it look good. But man, if you don't have a story, so we spend, as you guys know, in my class, it was all about telling a story. Yeah, yeah. Because like I feel like you give note like, hey, that scene wasn't needed. I'm like, oh yeah, you're right. Oh <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I'm also I'm notes. also big about editing yourself yeah. down and like. Wow. Killing your babies. You know, Kill was, your babies. That's yeah. not mine. That's, Zeme that's Zemeckis. That's no. Bob, Robert Zemeckis came there. And that might have been the Spielberg story he told me at the time that Bob Zemeckis told him. I don't know. Kill the baby. <laughs> Kill your babies. We should probably explain to your audience. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're writing something or when you're filming and editing, um, there, and you were just talking about how you and your crew, they're saying, we've got to cut it down. You've got to cut stuff out. And very often it means, I know you wrote that scene, you loved it, or you filmed that scene, it was beautiful, but is it, is it helping the story? Is it making the story drag? If it is, kill your babies. Kill that scene. Take it out. Trust me, editing a script, making it shorter, making it faster is better. Editing a film. Uh, real quick story. We wrote a, a script for um, Warner Brothers called Revere, about Paul Revere, American Patriot. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the studio at Warner Brothers, they're real tricky. I, I wrote it, and it was in the modern era. I wrote it, you know, and I gave them a disc. Uh, yeah, it was a disc, I guess. I didn't send them a P. And Warner Brothers, even to this day, they have a, a steno pool. They have these ladies sitting in this room with typewriters or computers now. But they retype every screenplay they get. Whoa. And I'm like, why are you doing that? I, I just gave it to you. They retype my screenplay in Warner Brothers format, which is kind of considered the true industry format. And they hand it back to you. So they handed me back the script. I handed them a nice 118-page script. They hand it back to me. It's 143 pages formatted correctly because I cheated my ass off. I was like moving margins and yeah. squeezing stuff. Uh -huh. And uh, they go, okay, you got to cut 23 pages. And I'm like, well, it's not possible. I'm world's greatest writer. Everything on that page is gold. There's not, there's not a word that can be cut. But we go in and we start cutting. And we and, and man, when we cut those, those 20, 30 pages, it, it just hummed. It read so well. And uh, that was my first lesson on the fly of editing and make it Get rid of stuff. Yeah. Make it like you know. They say like, don't marry your projects. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Don't fall in love with anything. Yeah. And I and I've written some stuff like this is gold. This is gold, and it's got. I think go. something. Yeah. yeah, like as as students, you you kind of get you think like, oh yeah, this is the best. But like mm -hmm. in reality, like there's a lot that yeah. can. Right, and then some of my students will get upset when I point out that yeah. that I didn't need that scene or that's going on too long. Yeah edit yourself and they, they don't understand because they're brilliant and it's right. gold. And yeah. I get it. I was that guy. So, yeah. 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 And he, uh, too bad we're perfect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Let's cut this podcast so down to five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I went real quick. Yeah. We're, we're at like one thirty. Okay. Already. Um, but yeah, like closing remarks. What, what are some films today that you kind of recommend people to check out in your top five? Wow. Like okay. All right. Three. Okay. All right. So, um, let me think of, of recent films. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Just the other night, I watched RRR. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. So, have oh, you so seen good. that yeah. movie? It's, it's a crazy so movie. Oh my, oh, my God. It's a Bollywood movie. It's on movie. Netflix. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, first of all, it won Best Song at the Academy yeah. Awards. So and, good. And, I'm like, and, the, and they did a dance number at the Academy Awards, which oh, was like funny. insane. So I'm like, okay. And I'm seeing clips. So the other night, I'm actually in Boston with some friends and like, hey, it's a movie now. Let's watch a movie. And my friend Sean, the one at the eulogy, uh, who, who, <laughs> eulogy guy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, guy. Fought, he he has what we call Syracuse sleeping sickness. You watch a movie, and in fifteen minutes he's sound asleep. My wife is also from Syracuse; she falls asleep. We start watching this movie R R R. It's insane, bonkers. The fight sequences. A guy fights a tiger. Like, yeah, right? He throws it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's it's an Indian movie, but it's Indian British, and um, and so they and the story is way over the top, crazy, and. So we're watching in, like, for like an hour and we hit pause, like bathroom break. And we, when it pauses, we realize it's a three hour movie and we're only an hour in. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it's been insanely good and entertaining. So we're like, oh my God, none of these people are going to survive. None of the people in the room are going to make it. Everybody stayed awake and we were like literally cheering out loud. So it is the craziest movie. You could not write it for American audiences. It's so <laughs> crazy over the top, but perhaps... Uh, this will change things. It did give me a little bit of an eye opener that what we, 
I think you might initially watch this and go, this is a stupid story or it's like ridiculous. And then you have to realize audiences in different parts of the world have a different perception yeah. as to what works mm -hmm. and it's what works in India and it's starting to work for us. But yeah, everyone needs to see RRR. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, it was the most entertaining film I have seen in decades. Yeah. Um, and and it's just, it's just a, yeah, it's just fun. But let me tell you, my three favorite films, um, I already mentioned one of them, and that was uh, Mary Poppins. I grew up on that as a little kid, you know, and so it was, it's a beautiful story, you know. Um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I, as a kid, I got to see that in the theater. I'm talking the original, not, not the Johnny Depp creepy version. Yeah, um, so it, uh, Willy Wonka is one of the darkest children's movies I've ever seen. You know, the, you guys remember the the, 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 the chocolate tunnel the there? Tunnel, yeah. 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 And, and I'm like, they're cutting a chicken's head off in that thing, in that sequence, if you watch that sequence. And and Willy Wonka is like, I don't know, is he a murderer? He's like yeah. so dangerous. Kids love that edginess. That's why it's a perfect film for me for little kids. It's a little slow, actually, to get to the, the chocolate factory, but it's um, but it's it, it's dark. It, it's real dark. And, and, and Gene Wilder is so maniacal, you just don't know if he's going to murder these kids or not. And then, to me, the best film that's ever been made uh, is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Oh, it's a cowboy one, right? Clint Eastwood movie. Um, and to me, uh, Westerns are some of the best films ever. They're the most epic stories. They're mythical in nature. Um, I've always tell my students, if you want to steal a story and turn it into something else, go watch a Western, and then just reset it in the city in the modern era or in outer oh. space. You know, mm. Star Wars is literally a Western. You know, I mean, look look at how Han Solo dresses like a cowboy. Yeah. Um, but the good, the bad, and the ugly, Clint Eastwood, Eli Wallach, Lee Van Cleef, three guys. The tagline for the movie is the Civil War, uh, uh, for three men, the Civil War wasn't hell, it was practice. Uh, and, and, and it is a long movie, and it is gorgeous. It's in, um, um, uh, uh, it's a spaghetti western shot in, it's shot in Spain, actually. But um, that is a movie everyone needs to watch. Yeah. And there, there might be 45 minutes where nobody talks. <laughs> uh, Clint Eastwood probably has like five lines in the whole movie, uh, but that to me is is by far one of the most perfect pictures uh, you'll ever see. That's yeah. awesome. I wish I could. Yeah. Have you watched Three Idiots? It's also a Bollywood film. No, I. I, oh, I that one's so good. That's so, my favorite so, movie of all time. So I will say that I'm on YouTube. I've been kind of going down the Bollywood rabbit hole, and I've just watched crazy dance sequences. Yeah. You know, and and, and I mean, their dancing is insanely cool, and yeah. the songs are catchy. Did you guys ever watch the uh, the YouTube video called Benny Lava? No. It's a guy who took a Bollywood movie and he basically he he wrote the lyrics on the screen of what he heard in English. <laughs> I think I've seen videos like that. And like the line is like, "My loony bun is fine, Benny Lava." They're speaking an in Indian dialect, yeah. but the the literal verbal translation sounds like crazy English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, watch Benny Lava one of these days. You'll get a kick out of that. That's awesome. Noted. Yeah, uh, I would say before we close out, like, do you have any advice you want to give maybe to like up and coming filmmakers? Like, yeah, you know? I'll tell you this. Yeah, uh, and I think this is a little bit of what you felt in my class. Hopefully, uh, is that don't listen to the negative people. Yeah. Don't listen to the assholes. Everybody here in Hollywood, um, not everybody. That's that's a totally unfair statement. Uh, but so many people in Hollywood want to tell you why you can't make it, yeah. and why you. Uh, I can't believe you came to Hollywood. You're going to fail. It's like uh, no. There's a big industry with millions of people in it. Uh, and, and everyone wants to watch what we are making. Yeah. So it, it, there's a place for everybody. But the, don't let people tell you uh, it, it sucks. Uh, uh, you know, there are, how many movies have you seen that you hate? You might hate it, but someone made it, so that bad screenplay became a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Your bad screenplay could become a movie. Hell yeah, it's uh, like a bad movie, y'all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but don't listen to the negative people. And, and, you got, and it's hard. You know, when I came here, um, uh, I met a lot of people who came here at the same time when I was a tour guide and then my friends and slowly I'd see my friends leave. Yeah. I had a lot of friends who ultimately left after six, seven years, like it wasn't happening. A lot of actors, mm -hmm. those kind of folks. And they left and I always felt like, what if it's tomorrow? Yeah. You know, what, what if the phone calls come in tomorrow and you're, and you're leaving, you know? Um, uh, it, it's tough. It, 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 Hollywood really is a lot of pressure and you feel bad about yourself more than you feel good. But I don't think you should give up. I, I really don't. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Wait, wait, what's what's like the what was the point in your career where like should I even be doing this? Oh, that's like every day. <laughs> <laughs> no. It, it, um, okay. Um, yeah. You, you know, you sell something and you're riding high. Uh, you get a lot of heat, and then you don't. And uh, you know, as I've gotten older, I'll tell you, the, you get less phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, there is ageism. 
Uh, it's fine because I've moved into teaching. You know, I started teaching as a side gig years ago, and I've enjoyed it so much because I'm. It, it's fun to sit in a, as a writer. It's a lonely ass job. You're sitting in a room by yourself. As a teacher, you're you're hanging out with fun yeah. people, hopefully. Um, but um, uh, the low parts are just when there's like that that job ended and the next job isn't on the line yet, you know, or you're, and then, then you get a phone call and suddenly things change, you know? Um, so there's high and lows. And, uh, but like I said, my wife is not in the industry. So we have a, uh, you know, my, my world is up and down and hers is very constant. Oh, yeah. I'm a Mary nurse. Yeah. <laughs> she's not a nurse. <laughs> she's the what director of a pathology laboratory, but still. <laughs> Tell her to hook me up with a yeah. friend. <laughs> and then last thing. Yeah. I wanted to show off this, ah. this great picture of you. We'll oh put it up God. on the screen. Okay, I got a story about that. And we too. want to know the story about right. this. And I also want your autograph. You can so, buy wait, that, right? You can buy yeah. it on Amazon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and the students in my class after yours yeah. bought it and gave it to me and all signed it. Yeah. So it's a story is this. I was interviewed by a Swedish magazine uh, in the 90 something, probably 95. And uh, they, they, and because I'd written track down about a tunnel, they said, well, we need to take a picture of you in front of a tunnel. That's a bad Swedish name. <laughs> uh, so we go up to Griffith Park. That's the tunnel by Griffith Park oh. by the observatory. And uh, they shoot a bunch of pictures of me. And then and somewhere in Sweden, I'm in a movie magazine. You know, there was an interview with me, and my picture was there. And that's the last I ever thought of that. I don't know, two years, three years ago, I'm just, you know, I Google myself. We all do. Uh, and then I Google my, I check myself out on Amazon for no reason whatsoever, mostly to see if, like what the price of one of my movies, because my name might be listed with. Mm. And then all these photos of me, and like not just one, like eight or nine photos <laughs> show up of me. And they go, you know, famous movie writer or, <laughs> or some, some like total superlative that's not true. And, uh, and I'm like, what the hell? I call my wife and I was like, they're, they're selling pictures of me on Amazon. <laughs> and uh, what it was was the photographer, whoever owned all these photos, sort of shot like a lot of Hollywood stuff. Yeah. And just his whole catalog went to some company that just, puts it up on the internet. So uh, yes, I am available on, on Amazon. I think it's about 35 bucks for that <laughs> picture to get the original one, but I don't even know if you get to own the copyright. Uh, and then, like I said, my students bought it uh, and I'm like, why don't you just print it off the internet? <laughs> and they Nurse signed port. it and gave it to me and it actually hangs in my office. I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm extremely proud of it. It's a picture so, of yourself yeah. hanging in your office. <laughs> it's a picture of me, but it's my accolades. From yeah, my yeah, yeah, and yeah, like, yeah. Uh, so yeah. But yes, that is that is pretty freaking hilarious, and yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't get a piece of that. So uh, no. just so you know, uh, you can well, buy it, but rip yeah. a piece off, give some. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you want a piece? <laughs> you want some? Yeah. <laughs> we need one of these. Yeah, yeah. honestly. All right. Well, so cool. Yeah. That was great. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is an honor. Hey, listen, to guys. In. I am uh, just real in close. I'm just real proud of you guys. Uh, uh, first of all, that you've remained tight. I think that's awesome. It's it's the network yeah. that's going to take you places. And uh, the fact that you guys are embracing technology and you're going to make it work for yourself, that's, you're on the right path. You're on the right path. So always call me when you need a positive note, when you're down. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. As, you, as my, your film dad. Like, <laughs> yeah. Papa. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Daddy. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> we call you Daddy? <laughs> uh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, wait on a lap. All right, cool. Thanks for tuning in. Shout out COC. This podcast yeah, studio is available. COC. Thank you, Austin Day, for helping us out. And uh, this is a beautiful studio. Yeah. We're honored to be here. Like, look, so look how much. official <laughs> hey Drew, cut to the master. Look at this. Look at these two TVs with us. It feels like we made it. We're, we're still not making money, but it feels like we made it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. we're making money in our soul. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's yeah. Listen, yeah, guys, uh, the money will my come. point is, don't leave. Don't leave Hollywood. Don't quit because the next day the call, the phone call is going to come. Yeah, and and trust me, you guys will be fine. Thank you. Yo, he's getting yeah. on his knees. Rap. That's Mary Kate. That's Mary. Mary. Yo, what with the fuck? Uh, touch on my love, on my rap, on my way. Love on my way. Yeah. Touch on my rub on my love on my rub on my What do you want my dick? All up inside your lips Wanna just grab this shit